We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, CD, uh, not CDS, CES just got underway. So uh, news yes. is pouring in. There's already been quite a bit. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of the first headlines that got out just prior to CES over the weekend, but we're not going to delve into all the CES stuff because we don't know it yet. We haven't had time to sift through it. So uh, yeah, even though you might be hearing this the week after sort of CES has uh, taken place, that we'll be covering it next week, just so you know. Yeah. Very exciting. Yes. Extremely excited. <laughs> CS has become less and less relevant in my life, to be honest with you. It's just, it's more gadgety and, you know, everybody's talking about Alexa. And Honestly, uh, so far this year from the news I've seen, it's been like, here's what might be cool in 2019. Because right. all the stuff so far has been super prototype, super here's what we can maybe do, or if it comes out this year, it's going to be crazy expensive. So this year so far, it hasn't been exciting as in, oh, I can't wait to buy that this year. It's like right. future tech. Right. So that's, I guess, what it is. Well, whatever. Not super worried about that. Well, we'll, you know, we'll see what it comes, if they come out with anything I mean, I just don't see anything on the horizon that sounds like it's going to be super groundbreaking. You know, we don't have any brand new audio formats or anything. I think we'll see some receivers that'll be able to do a couple extra overhead speakers and, you know, garbage like that. But, you know, nothing that's going to be <laughs> like, I mean, still, I, mean, I know that I feel like we're in an echo chamber here where Dolby Atmos is really a thing. Mm -hmm. But the reality is I don't think Dolby Atmos is really a thing. <laughs> it's just a thing for us. Well, the problem you know? is that it, it didn't support enough speakers until now. Oh, clearly. So that's, what people you know. really want to do is put 16 holes in their that's ceiling. Right. Yes. You know, they want to have just little dots of holes. All right. Let's get into this podcast. This is AV Rent, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com uh, where you can leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. YouTube.com slash C slash avrant. You can leave a comment there. It will not do you much good because <laughs> YouTube comments don't tend to get answered too often. So just email us at question at yeah. You can also email Rob directly at rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. And my Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Uh, we have our producer, Austin. Austin mans our question lines, helps put together the question list. And uh, he has his own podcast, the We Watch, po po we Watch Movies podcast, podcast about uh, big fluffy slippers. Mm. Yes, I can see the wearing, that. The wearing of, yep. the purchasing of. Are they the type of that look like animal heads or just, nope. just plain mm. but fluffy? Just plain but fluffy. They like them. They like them to look like normal shoes. They try to wear them to work and see if they can get away mm -hmm. with it. And they giggle like little schoolgirls every time they do. It is not the most compelling content, but it has a, a small but rabid fan base. Yep. So you do what you got to do. We watch movies. You can reach Austin on Twitter at Austin Pond. Austin spelled with a T E N, not a T I N. Yes, that's right. T E N. All right, that stuff that we got last week from what's his name, it's still sitting in that box over there. Yeah. I literally forgot it completely about it <laughs> the second this podcast ended last week because those of you that remember, we have Daisy, who's now on the podcast yes. with us, our new co-host, and she, uh, I was like, it is very cold in this house. Now, we mm -hmm. had a cold snap last week, which mm -hmm. was very cold for Florida. It was like, where I live, it was down in the 30s, mid-30s, and there's a lot of people out there who are like... I saw there was snow in Florida. There was yeah. up in Tallahassee, but that was nuts. So we are much lower than that. So it was very cold, though. And I was like, this house shouldn't be this cold. So I checked mm -hmm. the ace, the, the heater, and it wasn't blowing and stuff. And I got freaked out. So Daisy spent almost the entire night with me in the home theater because I was worried that she was going to freeze and die. Mm -hmm. Because that's what can happen. And in fact, our heater was out, and we got it fixed the next day. 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened. It seemed like... Uh, Hasn't been used in four years? <laughs> it has. <laughs> Shut up. It has. And uh, last year it worked just fine. But this year the guy came and said, basically, I had the settings wrong on the Ecobee, hmm. which didn't make much sense. The only thing I can think is that when the power went out for as long as it did, it reset something. And I didn't realize what it had reset. So I wrote down the settings, and hopefully now I won't have to pay the $67 idiot tax, which is basically what I Well, for people who can't see the video, uh, Daisy is your pet lizard. Yes. But she's a very good co-host. She's uh, she's very talkative, you know. She is. (laughs) We generally like our co-hosts to be a little bit more engaged, but it's late for her, and she's very sleepy. So she's hanging out on my shoulder right now. She's a uh, six-month-old bearded dragon. And I know it makes me weird for wanting her on the podcast, but it's my podcast, so shut up. And uh, I spent all, I was teaching at a school about an hour and a half south from here uh, all day, teaching science to fifth graders. And every teacher that came in the classroom, I was like, you want to see my new baby? And half of them <laughs> did not think that Daisy was a baby and mm. was very, they were, they did not like that. But the other, one, other ones thought, oh, that's really cool. So anyways, Daisy. Uh, it's already hot in this room. So last week I was complaining about being cold. Now I get to complain about being hot. What are we going to do? It's a, I, 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 I'm a glasses half empty mm-hmm. kind of guy. Let's start uh, by thanking our listeners of the week to become a listener week and to support the podcast in some way. First way to do that is go to www.avrant.com and click on the Buy Us a Cup a cup of Coffee link. And that Cup of Coffee link will send you to a PayPal donation site where you can give us a PayPal donation. Those donations go into our coffers to help pay for our hosting fees and shipping things and gear occasionally, programs that we might need for the podcast, uh, you know, when wires go bad and stuff like that. We use all that. Uh, mostly hosting fees and that sort of thing. So we want to thank Jack for going to www.avrent.com and cl- and giving us a PayPal donation. So thank you, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Thank you for the donation. We also want to thank our patrons over at Patreon. Patreon.com uh, is a website where you can uh, sign up to give a artist of your choice a monthly donation, a reoccurring and uh I think the minimum was a dollar a month, mm-hmm. which is twelve dollars a year for those of you that are math uh, impaired. And uh, we, I would set it lower if I could, but I can't. So a dollar a month it is. And we have now fifty-one different patrons. That's up from forty-eight of last week. And uh, while I know that I can go through and thank you all fifty-one of you individually, I would rather just make you email us and remind us that you are a patron, so that we can say it on the podcast. So we want to thank Byron and our fifty other patrons from Patreon. Yeah, it's uh, very cool to see that uh, Patreon number continue to tick up. At some point, I'm sure it will level off and or go down. But uh, for right now, it continues to climb week after week. So that's very cool. Byron, thanks for signing up. And to our 50 other patrons, thank you so much for supporting the podcast. And if you can't support the podcast financially, we understand. If you find some other way to support the podcast, if you let us know, we will make you one of our listeners of the week. So we want to thank Robert. He emailed Butt Kicker, who's a maker of not shoes, but... uh, tactile transducers that shake your couch with bass Mm -hmm. Uh, he emailed them to let us know that he had heard about them through us and michael let accessories for less know that he ordered his denon avr s920w receiver from them thanks to us so thank you robert and thank you michael yeah robert michael thank you very much for uh talking us up to those manufacturers in the news as it is Mm -hmm. uh, at this moment on the first Monday of SES or whatever it is. Uh, LG announced their 2018 OLED and Super UHD TV lineup ahead of CES 2018. Excuse me. For OLDs, they're mostly touting their beefed up processor and ability to show 120 frames per second content. You know, because Plasma's going to do 600 <laughs> frames per second, but whatever. Uh, but no major changes to light output or HDR. And on the LCD side, the two top series get full array local dimming, which appears to be a trend across many LCD TVs this brand. Uh, this year, I'm sorry, brands this year. So we're going to see more local dimming, it looks like, which yep. is something we should have been seeing a long time ago. <laughs> uh, in the first uh, in the first for consumer displays, LG's OLED, OLED TV's full 3D. They, uh, I'm going to try this again. I should have done some like vocal warm-ups, like she sells, she sells on the seashore, all that stuff, right? Okay, anyways. 
In the first for consumer displays, LG's OLED TV include full 3D lookup tables that can be auto-calibrated using CalMan. For those who don't know, CalMan is a program that you can buy for video calibration. So this means that the TVs are included, the, 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 the lookup tables are included inside the TVs, which is kind of nice. Makes it a little bit easier. So it should be possible to calibrate them to be exceedingly accurate, provided they didn't mess up the tables. Yeah, so, so if you yeah. want to understand what a lookup table is, just imagine that here comes the signal, but the signal isn't something the TV can necessarily show completely accurately. So the right. lookup table is like it's a series of offsets. It's like when the signal says do this, here's how I have to adjust the signal so the TV can show that accurately. Uh, and a 3D lookup table means that it's not only the XY coordinates to get the exact right shade of the color, but it's also the luminance of the color, how bright the color is. So it's all three of those axes being adjusted for every single pixel, every single frame. Uh, that's something that we really haven't had in a consumer display before, so pretty cool. And they're also, this is again, still LG that we're mm -hmm. talking about. They're showing a prototype 65-inch OLED that can roll up like a poster into a very slim, well, pretty slim base, we think. I mean, we're pretty sure that's what it looks like that's yep. happening. It doesn't look like there's any sort of weirdness going on. But yes, it's it's, it's like a, it's almost like a pull-up screen, except it, I guess it's motorized. Yes, it it's is motorized. It's got to yeah. be motorized, right? Oh, yeah. It's got to be. It is. Yeah. So Warner Brothers uh, joined the HDR10 Plus Alliance, and there's new there's a new HDR10 Plus logo that you can now look for on things to be there, which includes Samsung, uh, 20th Century Fox, Panasonic, the Warner Brothers, and Prime Video. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Them's the HDR10 Plus Alliance. And Panasonic made some announcements ahead of uh, CES as, as well. First up, they say that HDR10 Plus is now part of the Ultra HD Blu-ray specification. So it's an optional format now, just like Dolby Vision. Next, they announced that OLED T, uh, models that support HDR10 Plus, but not Dolby Vision. Mm. So they'll only be available in Europe, no North American releases. They use a new screen filter to get rid of the magenta tinge. Uh, LG did something very similar last year, and they're introducing new dynamic lookup table uh, for better tone mapping. So That was another common thread across the TV announcements. Everybody's doing some kind of dynamic tone mapping now, which is something LG started doing last year, and now everybody, they, they all have their different names for it, of course. But of course. essentially, it's taking the HDR10, the base layer HDR10 that has static metadata, and doing some way of, uh, you know, analyzing the signal and dynamically adjusting the screen on the fly, scene by scene. So everybody's doing that now. I forgot who we're talking about here. Panasonic. We talking about? Panasonic. Finally, they announced new Ultra HD uh, Blu-ray players that support HDR10+. Interestingly, the flagship UB820 player will also support Dolby Vision. So it's the first Ultra HD Blu-ray player announced to support all of the HDR formats, even though their own TVs currently do not do that as of yet. That's right. Which, which is fine. I mean, that's fine. Uh, so how long do we think before uh, OPA releases uh, update? That's yeah, gonna, well, that's I mean, when HDR10 Plus was very first announced, uh, OPA was like, it, if it's possible, we'll do it. So yeah. we'll, we'll, have, we'll just have to see. Um, for their part, I mean, LG has supported all of the HDR formats more than any other TV manufacturer. Now, their rivals with Samsung and HDR10 Plus was largely developed by Samsung. So... Not quite clear whether that'll get added there, but uh, as far as like having the available processing power, their new models that they just announced for this year, they're like, yeah, totally beefed up, like 35% power boost across the board. So uh, they've got the processing power. They're, if HDR10 Plus takes off, I, it would not shock me at all if a new LG TV could support it. All right. So Samsung unveiled their home version of their micro LED cinema display. They're calling it the wall. Uh, I'm sure Roger Waters is currently suing them. And it is uh, 146 inches diagonal. It's 16 by 9 with UHD resolution or Ultra HD re resolution. But since it's made up of many small modular tiles, it could theoretically be just about any size and aspect ratio. But it can't really. Though really, I mean, you you, you change the the pixel density. You, yeah, you, you end that, up changing right? the resolution, but uh, you know it can be scaled. <laughs> So. Yeah, it won't be. Yeah, I was gonna say it won't be 4K anymore. It'd be something That's right. else. Yeah. So, I mean, it might. Be, it certainly seems like it has applications for uh, the, uh, the the pro space. You know, the, oh, yeah. the retail space. So I mean, clearly this you know? this is not going to be a competitor to <clears throat> OLED. 
because right. even though these are micro LEDs, they're still considerably larger than the size that you can make. Yeah, they're like little lights, right? I mean, well, they're 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 LEDs. They're just small enough that you can put them. Right. Uh, a red, green, and a blue LED close enough together to put 8 million of them in the space of a 146-inch diagonal screen. Uh, so they're right. very, very small compared to traditional LEDs, but they're still considerably larger than O LEDs. Uh, so this is really the alternative to a projector. You know, 146 inches, clearly, that's a projection image size setup, not a flat panel size setup. Right. Uh, but... Uh, one one person, like, obviously they're not announcing price. Uh, they're saying this thing won't even av be available to anybody to buy until 2019. Um, but somebody was saying, like, yeah, I think about $2 million for this 146-inch. <laughs> so this is not a competitor. How bright does this thing get? That's the real... That, uh, well, that's the, the, real the full cinema display that they have in Korea, that one um, goes up to 500 nits. Oh, well, so. it's going to do a heck of a lot better than that. It's good for for that much money, man. Come well, on, that one's a real. thirty foot screen, though, so maybe there's a oh. power thing going on. So, yeah, the, li the lights all dim. For all the people who are like, <laughs> "Oh, this is going to kill OLED," it's like, no, these really are apples and oranges. They're, they're hmm. completely different segments. Oh, uh, who was it that sent us the gift cards? Was it do you gift cards? Was it that was James. That was James. James. I uh, let James know. He said that we had to buy something frivolous. I didn't buy something frivolous, but so far I have purchased a cookbook. Okay. I got a how to make cured sausages and meats. It's like a salamis and stuff like that. I've always wanted to start making stuff like that, mm -hmm. and I've uh, never gotten around to buy myself a book. And I had the money. And I was like, "There we go." So there we go. So far, that's what I bought. <laughs> I was looking at trying to get all the Captain America movies because I've only got like, Civil War. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get the other two because they're both very good. Mm -hmm. But I uh, have not done that yet. All right, got some comments from some listeners. James, different James on Facebook. He just wanted to share a fun project that his brother and his nephew are doing. They took an old TIAC tape desk, uh, deck case and stripped out all the innards. They put a touch screen where the door uh, for the cassette used to go, and they put a Raspberry Pi inside. So now it's a network player with Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi, and HDMI. It's possible there is some empty space inside the case now, but it looks cool from the outside. <laughs> it is a big empty box. Okay, now if you want to make this a really high-end thing, First of all, all you've got to get rid of all the. There can only be one knob, right? <laughs> there can only be one button or. Having knob. those VU meters though, that's important. That's, that's cool. That's good. That's good. Those have got to work. And yeah, you got to make them bounce, right? And then you need to put uh, lead fins mm. on the inside that's like cooling that's to, right. to give it weight. So if it weighs somewhere around fifty pounds when you're done, you could sell that thing for like twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's a pretty good little idea. I don't know. I I, I, I like the, the touchscreen doesn't seem very conveniently placed for me. But then again, I my gear's all low, so I wouldn't want to have to go down there and touch it. But that's, that's a cool idea. Raspberry Pis are cool, too. Oh, yeah. Robert. Robert tried our advice and installed a single butt kicker LFE Mini for his love seat. It was easy to hook up, and he actually had to turn the volume down in order to keep it sounding and feeling natural. So the single unit was plenty, and his Dayton amp is having no trouble at all powering it. He's enjoying it and finding it uh, to be a nice substitute for actual tactile bass when he has to keep the volume low. So again, this, these are these tactile transducers. You, mm -hmm. you hook them to your couch, and then when the bass is supposed to be hitting and shaking you because it's so thunderous, it just shakes the couch instead, which gives you that sort of that same feeling. And he's liking it, which is something I personally loathe but uh i have i gotta be honest i have not probably experienced it in the optimal way if you do it I, subtly it actually can be pretty cool uh because the yeah. butt kickers are very accurate they're not just like they're not one yeah. setting for all they actually do respond to the exact frequency being played and if you keep it very subtle um, you know what right. you'll get at a lot of the um, full size cinemas because some of them have butt kickers installed. They've they've cranked it up too high most of the time. So uh, yeah. you know it doesn't have to be like that. But yeah, he was considering one of the full sized butt kicker LFEs, which is meant really for like an entire platform. Uh, oh right. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm glad you got the mini because clearly right. that was enough for one seat. That was enough for one little love seat. Yeah, uh, yeah and you know, I, I'm kind of of two minds of the whole thing. I mean, it, 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 when you're seat shakes because of the bass. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I watched a couple of movies in here this weekend and I finally finished off the Punisher series, mm. which uh, if you haven't seen that, I didn't love it until the end oh. and then I loved it. Oh, okay. I, I haven't finished it, was, it yet. So. I thought it was good, but the end was, and I won't, I won't even hint at a spoiler for you, Rob, but the end 
made the series for me. Okay. Made the entire That's series good to hear. for me. And we can talk about why afterwards, uh, after you watch it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, finished that up last night, and I've watched uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 in here recently. I've watched uh, Wonder Woman a couple times because I love it. And even though the end of that movie kind of sucks, but <laughs> uh, I mean, when you get, if you just watch it to the, to the part where they, you know, the no man's land part and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and you just kind of stop watching the movie at that part, you're good. <laughs> you watch all the stuff you need to watch. The stuff at the end with war was just like, pfft, that's lame uh but when it shakes the couch naturally you know it feels normal you know it feels like something that you would kind of expect to happen Mm -hmm. whereas i'm always the times i've had butt kickers and those sorts of things uh and even platforms that resonate that i've been on those have always felt too much or resonating at the wrong times so i am i'm glad that he's liking his and uh i really need to give it a shot myself i'm never going to unless i go to somebody's house and they have it but uh i'm, I'm never doing it here but uh i will i will I, I will concede that it's probably worth it chris uh he wrote this a while ago when he was getting crackling and uh audio dropouts he thought it was old speaker wire so he replaced it but the issue persisted he tried swapping the left front uh, uh the left and right front speakers and he noticed that the crackling had really only been happening in the front right speaker and now with the speakers swapped in their positions it was happening in the left so that means it's something it about the speaker. the speaker. Yes. Yeah, which is unusual. So uh, he called Paradigm, and they recommended that he pull off the back plate of a speaker and, and potentially tried bypassing the crossover to see if the drivers were making the noise uh, themselves or if the noise was coming from the crossover, which is, I got to be honest with you, that is a strange thing to ask. <laughs> I, I'm like, I, I read that like three times and went, what? But. As soon as he got a look on the inside, he noticed that the wires attached to the crossover, one of them had come loose. So he secured those, and now uh, clean sound, no more noise. It, it was the speaker wires, but it was the speaker wires inside the speaker. Yep. So that's where his crackling was coming from. Very odd problem, very unique problem, and I'm glad you figured it out. Mm-hmm. Though I have no idea what bypassing the crossover would have done. That just it. seems very bizarre. Uh, David. David went ahead and ordered the RBH A600 in-ceiling speakers and their matching backer boxes from the wholesaler. If remember, we talked about him last week. He's getting the really good price mm-hmm. and thought that because it was so low that they must not be good. So we guess that makes him an RBH dealer now. So if you want some to talk to David, I guess. Yeah. David, do you ship? What do you call it, charge for shipping? <laughs> uh, he bought six and would install them in the top front, top middle, and top rear positions because they're so cheap. He just bought a gross of them. Uh, he can now make uh, use of only four because of how, how receivers work these days. But he's hoping to eventually get a receiver that will support uh, 7.2.6. And in the meantime, he can experiment and find out which combination of positions he likes best. That is something I'm interested in hearing more about, David. Please yep. let us know which positions you think are the most beneficial, because I would like to know what you think. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping that during CES, we will get the news, because supposedly Den and Amaranth, because they're off-site, they're not in the main hall, they got their own. Oh, they're always at the Venetian. Yeah, they've yeah. always got their own uh, room set up, but uh, supposedly they'll be showing their new flagship models, uh, the AV8805 Pre-Pro from Marantz and the AVC X8500H receiver from Denon, which are supposed to do 13 speakers simultaneously. Uh, and they made it explicit when they sort of previewed them in China that that could be 7.2.6 or 9.2.4 with front wides. And they actually had front wide as one of the labels on the back of the receiver. Rob so is I, all a quiver. You just got back. a new receiver, dude. You just back. got one. It was like two <laughs> years ago already. Oh man, you're, you're there's we need a lot more patrons to support his habit. His habit alone. Red wides. <laughs> Michael just wanted to let us know that he thinks the behind the scenes YouTube versions of our podcast get more views than the complete two hour video versions because if other people are anything like him, they simply can't wait to hear each episode. He's in Austria. So our live recordings happen to line up nicely with his morning commute. He's streaming YouTube. Yeah, sure. That's awesome, man. Uh, he first heard us at episode 520. I don't know what episode we're on now. That's 670? We're at 573 now. Okay. So he heard, heard, first heard us at 520, and now he's listened all the way back to episode 300. 
Jeez, dude. He's got a lot of commuting to do. And so he says, thank you for all the information and entertainment. Michael, you're welcome. Yes. And I'm glad to know that we have some Austrians. Yeah, That's right. I, I don't know. usually put in like self-congratulatory emails, but uh, I just thought it was really cool that we have a listener in Austria. And anybody who is like can tolerate listening to the two of us going back hundreds of episodes. In, I mean, it must be a short amount of time. 520 only came out a year ago. So in the span of a year, he's listened to like... I have 20. So in the span of like 40 something episodes, no, 60, 50 something episodes, he's listened to a backlog of 200, 220 yeah. episodes. That's, uh, I don't know if that's congratulations or our I'm apologies. What, yeah. I think I'm sorry that we did this to you. <laughs> and I apologize that we're not better. We'll try. We're, we're working on it. So a different Rob, Rob M, wanted to share a tip for Canadian shoppers. We don't have the same selection of price uh, alert slash price tracking websites as our neighbors in the States. Uh, the only one I use is Amazon. I just go look. <laughs> but uh, he found a prowl, uh, I'm sorry, price alert. So it's price, instead of alert, it's owl, O-W-L. E-R-T. That's all one word. Pricealert.com. He says the site works well for Canadian online retailers, except for Costco for some reason. Yeah. Just thought it might be helpful for some Canadians out there. You know, and I, I, I heard something about this on the radio one time about how uh, Google and other uh, uh, other web uh, search engines undermined all those websites that were doing the price checking mm -hmm, for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and that there's like some sort of class action lawsuit or whatever a lawsuit about it. Uh, I just got, I just, I just stopped checking those things. I, mm. haven't, I haven't checked one in forever. So if I'm looking for a deal, Google sometimes will, sh you know, show me different places, and that's where I found my phone. I got my phone through eBay through finding it on the Google search where the Google shopping. Yeah, the Google shopping thing. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't used uh, a, a comparison website for anything mm. other than like hotels. Mm -hmm in forever so that's good good to know yeah give it a try i i don't know what i i can't vouch for it or deny it so uh yeah but check it out what can it hurt yeah ted so as we know ted is using a legacy audio silhouette on wall speakers for his front left center and right he's been very impressed with our output capabilities and overall sound quality i guess we have some pictures here for if you go just to as the a reminder video. so that uh, people can see these yeah. are large on wall speakers. very large on wall speakers i mean they're basically they're just very big speakers. Yeah. However, he says if he listens to a two channel recording in just stereo listening mode, he's noticed that the phantom center effect at his primary seat isn't quite up to the level of quality that he knows is possible. So if he moves to his back row, it actually sounds much better. If he moves forward as close to about five feet from the front wall, it sounds better too. Furthermore, if he sits in his primary seat and uses the actual center speaker versus up mixing, he gets the same slightly blurry disjointed sound from the center that's uh as what's produced by the phantom center so it's not the speaker themselves right if he moves forward or back the sound improves so it must be something to do with positioning correct but what is actually causing this and what is the solution is it the listening angle of the speakers if you were to spread them apart uh, wider apart or move them closer together could that solve the issue moving those big heavy on walls is a major hassle so he definitely doesn't want to do drill new holes without knowing for sure if he's going to get the improvements he's after this is the room isn't it isn't it like a, a some sort of reflection of the room yeah, Let's... so, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, there, I had a little bit more back and forth with Ted via email because first suspect is you're somehow just sitting in some kind of cancellation null. Um, See, that's what the first thought that came to me is like maybe he's sitting in like the exact perfect spot. Yeah. That is uh, the exact wrong that spot. He, well, wrong that that where some reflection from the ceiling or reflection from the side walls is yeah. creating uh, a cancellation that's just making things sound a little bit off where he is. Yeah, uh, mainly it was that. So first of all, he was sitting in his primary seat and noticing that, and then he goes and sits in his in his back seat. So he has right. he has actually a very small room. So he's kind of crammed two rows of seats. Uh, you know, propped one up on uh, like bed <coughs> bed leg risers. Um, right. So he's he's given that a try, and he's like, you know, the the imaging, the stereo imaging sounds much better in that rear seat. And mm. at first he was like, is that just because of the narrower listening angle? Uh, you know, he had set them up to be thirty degrees plus or minus thirty degrees left and right in his primary row. When he goes and sits in the back row, then they're closer to like plus or minus twenty four degrees, that type of thing. Right. So he's like, if he just moved them closer together, would he get the same result? And I was like, I really like definitely don't do that permanently. You know, right. if if you want to try temporarily moving them in some way, by all means, try that experiment. But 
I really think uh, that this is in effect because these are on wall speakers. I was like, it's one of two things in my mind. Either it's the front to back wall reflection. That, uh, yeah. And you just happen to be sitting in a place where it's canceling out, or it is the front wall effect, which is the exact reason why baffle walls were invented. Uh, the exact okay. reason why THX baffle walls were invented is because you can get from the sideways movement, because the sound waves are traveling, you know, 360 degrees. They're traveling in a full globe type shape. Um, you can get these phase interference patterns and the, if you could actually see what the sound waves are doing when they come off the side of the speaker and travel along the front wall sideways you actually get these little eddies just like pools of water just like a, a stream in a pool of water you get these little whirlwinds these little eddies and if that just so happens to be occurring it, where your center is located then you're going to get these odd phase cancellations if, if if you could see it you'd have all this weird comb filtering going on you might even have a big lobe that's coming out and if you're sitting right in the eye of that lobe which could be the right. case there's multitudes of things i mean sound wave interaction is really really complex so, so really, it sounds like what you you could do if if he if he's got some panels that he can move around even just temporarily, yeah. just placing them in different positions like between his his front speakers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, on the front uh, wall first, on the front wall right between his you know right around his center channel basically yeah. you try there on the outside of his front speakers at his first reflection points if he doesn't doesn't already have yeah. some there even like really thick blankets or something just something to s help absorb some of that sound yeah. because. You know, it's, it's going to be higher end information, too. That's going to be the problem yes. here. Yep. And that means that it's going to be easier to absorb than those, you know, the, these big panels that we have, the four inch thick and everything else. I mean, that's for base. We're trying to absorb. Yeah. Not, you know, yeah. When you're talking base, stereo okay. imaging, that's not the base. You're not going to notice no, no. that in the base. This is this no. is mid range and high. So, yeah, actually, the second part is very related. So. Okay, yeah. so let's go on. So Ted finds it odd that this is happening as main listening position. In that spot, he has a futon behind him that ought to be absorbing most of the back wall reflections. And yet, if he sits in the back row with a bare wall close behind him, the stereo image sounds better. What he's hearing is an issue of localization and placement of sounds within the sound stage. At his primary seat, it's very distinctively, dis distinctively left and right, and then kind of a blurry in the middle, even when using an actual center speaker. In the back row, it's nice, smooth, cohesive sound stage. Not this disjointed separation between left and right and no blurriness in the middle. If he moves forward, it's not quite as good as moving back, but he still gets a clear sound from the center and much better than at his primary seat. If this is all due to sound wave interference, Ted could understand that messing with the frequency response, but can it really mess with the imaging the way he's experiencing? He's just having trouble wrapping his, heads or his head around that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's where it comes in. Uh, you know, this sort of phase cancels it. Here's a perfect example, right? Here's a perfect example. Anyone can try this at home. Take one of your speakers, switch the red and the black wires, and listen to it in stereo. Now, you've done nothing. You've changed your room zero amount. Yeah, you didn't move anything. You didn't, you didn't move change anything. how loud anything is. No. You didn't change the frequency response of the speaker. Just switch one of your front left and right speakers, the, the black and the red wire. This will not damage your speaker no. as long as you don't do it while the amplifier is on. Okay, <laughs> just turn everything off. Switch the speaker wires, turn everything back on, on one speaker, and then go listen to it and say to yourself, how is it possible that this is making that much of a difference? It's making this much difference because that's what interference can do. That's what sound can do when it's not being produced the way that we are trying to produce it. You know, and these little interferences, even though they're small, even though you know they're you're 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 not that far away from it, and you can change your position, it makes it a lot better. They they can make that big of a difference. Yeah, the illusion of stereo imaging because it is an illusion. It, yeah, because it yeah. sounds like something is coming from straight ahead of you, but the, you are listening to two sound sources, one to your left and one to your right. So how do you create this illusion that it's coming from straight ahead of you? It's actually, it's it's really quite difficult. You Your left and your right ear must receive identical information in order for it to convince you that it's coming right. from straight ahead of you. Now, identical information is more than just, I got the same frequency response and I got the same level, the same volume level at both ears. Those are important. Those both must occur, but you must also get the exact same timing information. The sounds must arrive at your left and right ear at exactly the same time. And we don't, it doesn't have to be off by very much 
for the image to move to the left or right or to be destroyed, as it seems right. is happening in Ted's case, we're pretty darn sensitive to that timing information. We're even more sensitive to the volume information. Um, but that's that whole, um, sorry, what was that What was that effect called? I'm forgetting the name of it now. I know it's the Doppler press- effect? The, uh, sorry, which? The Doppler effect? No, no, it's, it, it's the precedent effect is the generic name. Oh. There's, a, there's a person's name that was attached to it. I forget, it started with oh, an H, no. I think. But anyway- Point being, all of these things have to line up. So if you were to measure the frequency response, it's probably fine. Uh, if you were to measure the volume levels between the two of them, it's probably fine. This is almost certainly a phase issue. Uh, right. And it is a place because you, you, you've found out for yourself. You move back, you move forward, and suddenly you're not in whatever this whatever this odd phase cancellation that's happening at this one spot in your room. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's right. really what it is. Yeah. And it's funny when uh, if you do, do if you do the test where you switch the wires, mm. you're going to be blown away by how weird your speakers yeah. suddenly sound. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is it is it, it, it will drive you absolutely nuts. It sounds like it's all coming from one side of the room, and it's all weird. Or you know? almost like everywhere sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like- yeah, I mostly I mostly find that to me it sounds like it's coming from out of one speaker more mm-hmm. than the other. But when you try to, to to figure out how which speaker it's coming out of. It like changes. And, yeah, it, you know what I mean, it, the imaging moves depending on where you move. You are <laughs> right, that, yeah. right. It's very bizarre. Yeah. So you know, if it doesn't take a whole lot. So he says he tried to take some uh, Room EQ Wizard measurements in, in his primary seat and in the back row, but the base response clearly looks different. But other than that, he's not sure what differences he should be seeing. What in the measurements would indicate good or poor imaging? Ooh, this would be wow. hard to see. That phase, would be stre- phase. Yeah, it's a, hard. To see. It, it'd be very hard to see. I mean, you'd have to take individual measurements of each speaker and then somehow be able to compare the, the phase differences between them yeah. and then know what you were looking at i have a feeling that trained uh you know speaker designers and acoustic designers all that stuff would go i i, I don't i don't know what it's supposed to look like but i know what it's supposed to sound like <laughs> I, mean, I mean truthfully you'd have to do this with at, at a minimum dual microphones because it would it has to be the same pl- signal playing simultaneously right and being measured at both so a minimum you could do it with two microphones ideally you'd be using one of those dummy heads right. uh and then you'd have to be look because the, the like you say the frequency response is probably going to look the same that's not the issue like in in i understand that ted's having a bit of difficulty wrapping his head around it because it's like the frequency response looks the same. The volumes look the same. Why is this happening? And I mean, the difference is in timing. We're talking down to like 0.1 of a millisecond sometimes. Right. Now, is it possible to see that in measurements? Yes, that is that is possible. But man, oh man, would you have to scrutinize. It's right. definitely not something that's going to jump out at you. As if there's any amount of smoothing happening to that signal, it's gone. Uh, we yeah, are, we you'd are, have to really, you'd have to have very fine measurements. You'd have to have. Uh, oh, you'd, I mean, you'd, ex- you'd need you'd, a and, and, computer design to analyze the phase response. That's what you would need. You, yeah. you couldn't do this by eye. Yeah. No. So yeah, that that's why. I mean, it, it looks like a mystery, right? This is one of those things where you know the um, you know the audio files who are like, oh, there's things you can't measure. Well, this is one of those things where they're almost right. Like you actually can measure it, and it can be yeah. analyzed. But to actually see it in a graph with your human eyes, you're gonna have a heck of a time explaining that. So where it's a lot easier just to sit in the room and go, that doesn't sound right. right. You, yeah, know, exactly. just, you know, <laughs> that sounds like the phase is this off. This is one or of something. those things where you will notice it with your human ears long before you notice it with the objective measurements with a single microphone, yeah. That's right. Ryan. Ryan picked up a pair of a Sand Acoustic CBM 170SE speakers on Craigslist, and he's enjoying them so far. So now he'd like to round out the rest of his speaker system. The room is 9.5 feet wide, 12 feet long, 7 feet high. He'd be sitting about 7 feet from his 65-inch TV. Should he go for three CMT 340SE speakers up front while moving his CBM 170SEs to surround uh, duty only? Or uh, is there a different complement of speakers we'd recommend for his setup? Let me see here. I don't know these speakers that well. What, tell me about these CBMs, 170 SEs. Yeah, so those were uh, Ascend's like first bookshelf speakers. These, you know, they've okay. since upgraded the drivers now, but it's sure, your, sure, sure, it's sure. your traditional two-way tweeter and woofer bookshelf speakers, six and a half inch drivers. So your very standard bookshelf design. Um, now, given how small this room is and, and how close you're sitting to these speakers, yeah, 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 yeah. The CMT 340 SEs, they're their bread and butter is being able to play really loud. Yeah. You don't need that. You really no. don't need that. Now, the CMT340 center, 
that might not be a bad choice because the, sure. the CBMs are pretty almost cube shaped. So it might be a little bit weird to use a third CBM as your center. Whereas the, the CMT is just going to have that traditional horizontal shape right. and, and look like a, a center. So, you know, getting that as your center. But I personally, I would, in this setup, we are so close in the room, so small, I would keep your CBM 170s as your front left, right. Choose yeah. whichever center you like. And then get the smaller HTM 200 SEs, which are six inches from front to back, wall mountable, sealed design. Get those for your surrounds because you're going to want to wall mount them. And uh, you're going to want them to be small and easier to, you know, put closer to the walls. So that that's the compliment I would go for in this setup. So it's funny when you go to a speaker manufacturer that makes, you know, good speakers. And uh, most of the ones that we talk about this, I'm not I, I, uh, on this podcast. This the, this uh, statement is applicable to them as well. You know, you get to you get an older pair of speakers. You're like, well, I've got this older pair. Uh, that I bought, I find on Craigslist for cheap. But I, I need to fill out the system. I'm going to get the, these newer pair. I'll use those as my fronts. That's not always the best or even the, the thing you want to do. These older pairs are usually pretty well matched to the newer stuff because they have a design philosophy and a sound uh, philosophy as well. They want to give you that same sound. They don't want your customers to go, I bought these speakers 10 years ago. I bought some new speakers and they sound completely different. <laughs> you know, it, They want to have some some coherence across their entire line. And just because these speakers are older doesn't make them bad. I mean, are the, are the surrounds on them good? Are the rubber surrounds on them good? Do they play? Uh, are they ripped anywhere? Are they making any sort of weird noise? Nope. Throw them up front. They sound like they're more than big enough for your room. So get oh. something smaller for your surrounds. I agree. Uh, okay. He'd like to add some Gick acoustic treatments. Nothing too crazy or over the top. And so, just so we're aware, he already bought curtains to cover the window and the closet opening. Could we give him some recommendations on how many panels and where to place them? Uh, is it just these two pictures, right? Oh, there's uh, no, pictures. there's, uh, yeah, so uh, we're, we're sort of seeing uh, I see, I see, see, around see, see, see. the room. So, yeah, this is a small room. Now, he's already painted what appears like it's going to be his side walls as a dark gray, and the front and back walls look almost black, if not if not black, right. very, very dark gray. Um so I'm yeah. guessing the screen or whatever is TV is going to go on the wall that's not going to have the door opening into it. I'm guessing is what that's going to be. So that yes, that I would think that, so. Which uh, means closet he's... opening would be on the in the front left. I would assume so. Yeah, and his is, window is, will be on the front right. That is a lot like my room. Okay. Uh, okay. My my window is in the midpoint of my right wall. Mm -hmm. So yours is set in the front right. Uh, and, but my closet is in the front left mm -hmm. and the door is in the midpoint of the left wall and I have a door in the back that goes to the bathroom. So we have similar rooms. Okay, so what I did is this. I have a, uh, let me see if this will work for you. I have a subwoofer in the front left corner, kind of like right in, uh, yeah, right in, uh, in front of where the closet would be there. Okay. So that, that little closet, not inside the closet, but where that little quarter wall thing is. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to know what we're talking about. But basically, the, there's a, a, a closet door, and then right next to the closet door is the door that comes into the room, mm -hmm. and that's the whole left wall pretty much. Okay? So there's a little bit of a wall uh, from the closet to the very front wall on the on that left side there. Right there is where I put my, my – and mine's almost the same size as yours, that little wall thing. So that's where my, my subwoofer is. My back subwoofer is cheated into the room from uh, the uh, in the, the, the rear right corner. Mm -hmm inside the room right there so that it matches like you know uh, uh, the, the 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 mirror image basically a reversed image of that okay so uh and then i put in my front right and both rear corners tri traps from geck okay. those are the those are the corner traps inside my closet on in the left in, in, in the front left where it would be the as far front left corner there's also a tri trap in there okay Along the front wall, along the floor, there's tri traps on the floor. Ah, okay. Because that, uh, that's how many I have. Okay, they just happen. That's, that's how many I have. Got those there. Then I have uh, inside of that closet on the left, I have a panel on the, like, just kind of leaned up against the wall mm -hmm. in there. Okay, and that just kind of sits there. And I don't have anything. In, I don't have a screen in front of that. I could have put a screen in front of it. I have. Yeah, a so he's going to have uh, you know curtains going there, but that's sounds yeah. going to go through those. So having, so, having yeah, the inside I, of that closet uh, treated with some absorption, good idea. Yep. And then I have uh, wall hung panels, a large one on my uh, right near my first reflection point on my right wall, 
on my between my door, right where your light your light switch is there, which mm -hmm. is of course is not going to work for you, but you can maybe do this if you wanted to put two smaller panels. I put one panel there, one thin panel. I imagine I myself, you might put so a surround it. speaker there. That could be the case. Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. So, but maybe uh, below the light switch, you could put something there if you wanted to. You don't have to. On the back wall, I back have two wall, small. Yes. Uh, the two, I have two small panels. You could have two large ones. I don't have space for two large ones. And uh, on the side walls behind my couch, I have the equivalent of one four by two panel. I have two two by two panels, which I have offset because it looks nicer. But so that's he, basically he could what do all of that other than his the first reflection back. point on the right side, the windows there. So it would have to be freestanding or right. kind of tucked into the window. Well, bill, if he's going he to put a curtain in front of that curtain, anyways, yeah. that's right. Who cares? Put it behind the curtain. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it could, it could just be sitting on the floor too. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. If you've got no, a curtain that goes down to the floor, it can just be leaning there on the floor, just sitting on the floor. Well, so yeah, you, you could tuck it up in that window too. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, 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 depending on where your tweeter is in relation to that window, you could tuck it right inside that thing. Yeah, no, I mean, th there's, he says he doesn't want anything crazy. There's nothing fancy about acoustic treatments. You, you basically want definitely the back wall. There's, there's no reason you shouldn't have panels on your back wall. Yeah, so that cuts down on that. I'd probably put some on the front wall too, behind my front left and right speakers. So that gets rid of your front to back corners, any corners that you can absorption inside of that closet. And then if you can treat the side walls where you're going to get reflections, that's where you go. And that's about it. That's, that's really all you need. Yeah. So his receiver is a Denon X3300W, so we can add two Atmos speakers for a 5.2.2 setup. Would in-ceiling speakers be best, or could he maybe just mount speakers up high on his side walls and call them top middles? Uh, I mean, you could get the prime elevation speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. You could get the Focal Birds, you which is like to mount birds. them directly to the ceiling, mm. uh, which works too. So can you do what you suggested? Yes. Would it be better if they were cheated in on on the ceiling a little bit? I believe so. I don't think you have to put in ceilings. They're not necessarily best. But uh, how high is this room? Is it seven? It's, it's only, only seven, seven feet foot. high. And it's yeah. only, did he say nine feet wide? I mean, it's only nine and a half feet wide. So, I think the prime elevation speakers might be a good option. Yeah. For, I mean, here. given how narrow this room is, even if they yeah. were on the ceiling, how much closer together would they honestly be? Yeah. Like a foot? Two feet? <laughs> Prime elevation speakers could be your top yeah, mills. I, mean, I like it. Yeah, g given how narrow this room is, I, I could definitely see the prime elevations being good here. You could even do where they are technically mounted to the ceiling. So like the, the shorter angled part, the shorter flat part would be against the side wall and the longer back part would be up on the ceiling where the mounting bracket is. So the angle is, is coming in A that little, way. It's, it's quite steeper. It's a lot steeper that way. Yeah. yeah. You could even do it that way if you wanted to, but yeah, that would be a good idea. This, uh, so you're actually you're actually physically mounting them to the ceiling, right? Correct. Yeah. But they're up in that corner as if you they were wall mounting them. Yeah, yeah, that would work. Yeah, because I, I think work. going to the whole cutting holes in the ceiling, uh, I'm not super enthusiastic about that. Yeah. I mean, if, if if you want to, by all means, but this is a case where, yeah, I could definitely see you mounting prime elevations up there and it working just fine, given how narrow your room is. Yeah. All right, let's go on. Mike. This is uh, Mike from Canada. Mm -hmm. So, Mike decided to heed our advice and forego the Fluence bipole surround speakers he had in mind in favor of using SVS speakers all around. Ultras up front, primes for the surrounds, which was good because that was a weird thing. Uh, we <laughs> talked about him a couple weeks ago, I believe. For his in-ceiling Atmos speakers, he was considering HTD, but we suggested Outdoor Speaker Depot instead. He's heard us mention both KEF and RSL, though. Are, both are more expensive than the... Uh, the OSD models. I got lost by that. Outdoor Speaker OSD? Depot. OSD. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, I, I was stuck on the HTD. Uh, but would either of them be worth the extra money? And with the RSL in ceilings uh, being angled, are they actually a good choice for Atmos as RSL uh, claims? If you wanted to step above the OSD and in ceiling speakers, what would be the most worthwhile upgrade? So keep in mind I, that his fronts and surrounds are going to be SVS. So that's what right. trying to match if it's anything. Yeah. So the outdoor speaker depot, and, and uh, Grant, I haven't heard these speakers yet, and we're going solely based on Rob's recommendation here. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is the Atmos, it's just, <laughs> it's just, I, 
I, I just as long as don't they're not offensively that, bad. <laughs> yeah, I just don't think it matters all that much. You know, I really, really super don't. You know, uh, it, 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 so many things work in your favor for not n- caring about the quality of your Atmos speakers. <laughs> you know, you you're, they're they're usually a little bit behind you or way above you. They're not playing nearly as often. They're not playing nearly as loud most of the time. And uh, your ears aren't aimed in the right direction. You can't hear that well in the uh, there's so many things. Plus, there's the Dolby curve that's going on mm. with these things, and we don't even really know what's going on there. So who knows if the speaker that is good is good. Can you get something better? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, do I think in ceilings being angled is a good thing for Atmos? Well, Dolby doesn't, so I don't know why RSL seems to think so. It does allow you to place them in non-optimal placements, but if you can place them so they are where they're supposed to be, they should be aimed straight down. Yeah, or when That's... you're using speakers that don't have the wide dispersion that Dolby wants you to have. Right, right, I right, mean, right. Golden Ear is, is almost responsible for this whole angled thing because Golden Ear speakers with their folded ribbon tweeters do not have have the super wide dispersion in all directions that Dolby right. is asking for. So they use their angled in ceiling speakers, which they initially invented to be like your front left, center, right. You know, right. that's what they From invented them for. But yeah, they're yeah. like, hey, these actually end up working pretty okay for Atmos because our speakers don't have the super wide dispersion. Well, people, for whatever reason, kind of glommed up because they're like, oh, they're aimed at the seating position. It must be better. It's like, it's not really what it was intended. It was a compromise. It was a, it was a way of addressing yeah. a shortcoming quote unquote shortcoming um, of their speakers in the way that Dolby originally intended for them to work in those Atmos positions. So the angle isn't necessary if you have the wide dispersion that Dolby wants you to have. Um, Upgrading to something like Kef, like this would make sense to me if you're building a fully dedicated, fully enclosed room, you're using Kef R series speakers all around and you're like, and I want to have Kef in ceilings too. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. But when they're going to Even be... then, if you said you wanted to get a, a cheaper speaker for the, and save a little money, I'd oh, be yeah, like, yeah, 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 that's totally what you but could it, do. You know, <laughs> in, that, in the scenario described, it'd be like, okay, I'm not going to try and tell you, no, you must right. spend less. It's like, okay, I can see where you're coming from. But here, the KEFs aren't going to perfectly match the SVSs anyway. You're trading one non-perfect match for another non-perfect match, so why spend more to do it? If you yeah. want speakers that I would consider better than the Outdoor Speaker Depot ones that aren't going to break the bank and are available to Canadians, uh, I would point you to Aperion. Aperion's yeah. Intimus in-ceiling speakers, they go for $300 US dollars a pair, uh, but they do ship them to Canada. Um, you know, they're, they're very nice speakers. If you want to, you can angle the tweeter. I wouldn't recommend doing that. I think that throws off the dispersion because you're not yeah. angling the woofer at the same time. Um you know, they're nicer speakers than the outdoor speaker deeper ones, but I'm like, I would really struggle to tell you that it's worthwhile. Right. Um, no, I agree. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I don't see any reason to do it. But if you really want to. If you really go. want to, there. That's the you got money burning a hole in your pocket. And that's you right. just want to, like, you want to just... know that you have better quality speakers yeah. up there for whatever reason. It's just going to make you feel better. That's fine. Yeah. If you're just like, I can't stand the idea of these inexpensive right. speakers, then there you go. So since Mike's L-shaped basement is being finished, he has some options for soundproofing when it comes to the walls and ceiling. All the various rooms and closets and such will have doors. And that's not shown in this render that we're about to show on yeah. the full video. Uh, but the overall space will still be L-shaped. He can't change that. Uh, at least he can if he wants to stay married. Uh, he was planning on going with the basics. Uh, insulation in the walls and ceiling. Spray foam for the exterior walls. Regular insulation for the interior walls and ceiling. Plus resilient channels to hold a drywall. But should he consider something more or something else as far as construction goes? This is a basement, right? It is. Did he say, did he say something about the ceiling? Because I think the ceiling is where you're, you're going to run into your biggest problem. That was there, but... insulation in the ceiling. His idea was resilient channel. Oh, yeah, yeah, joists, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drywall. Yeah. But, you know, single layer of drywall, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, you could do double layer of drywall, but you have to do the whole ceiling. That's just that's what it comes down to. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do that, you got to do the whole ceiling. It can't just be the area above your home theater or whatever. Anything that's inside that enclosed L-shaped area ha- would have to have that. Yeah. The remaining steps that you could do. And I wholeheartedly recommend that you contact the people at soundproofingcompany.com. Somebody needs to tell them that we keep recommending people talk to them. Yeah, that's true. Uh, because, I mean, they, they give advice for free and they give very good advice. All they do is soundproofing over there. That's um, right. So this is a matter of 
so so first of all, even if you did uh, everything that you described, insulation, yes, definitely do that. Yeah, that's uh, a good idea. The resilient channel. Now you could alternatively use sound clips and hat channels, which take up a little bit more space and are a little bit harder to short circuit. Resilient channels work fine, though, as long as everything is installed properly. Usually where resilient channels fall down is somebody ends up putting a screw or a nail through the resilient channel into a stud, and now you have short-circuited the whole system and essentially rendered it useless. That's usually where it falls down. But effective-wise, resilient channels and sound clips and hat channels are pretty darn similar, and resilient channels are cheaper, so just make sure it's installed correctly. Um... The, the main things that you could do in addition to that would be to add a second layer of drywall with green glue in between. Yeah. Now, if you simply use the single layer of drywall that you're proposing and make sure that every seam is really well sealed, and that's going to be with acoustic sealant, that's what you want, which is stuff that never fully hardens, never fully cures, it stays elastic. Make sure that every seam in that single layer of drywall is sealed. If you do that, if you were to add the second layer of drywall with the green glue, you would improve the soundproofing but it's a question of how silent do you need it to be no none of this soundproofing is so silent that if you cranked your system to reference volume you wouldn't hear a peep upstairs nothing right. is going to get you to that but how quiet do you need it to be uh i would talk to soundproofingcompany.com it sounds like you want to try and save money so it, it's it's highly questionable whether it's worth going because that's a quite a bit more expense to do the green yeah. and the second large drywall. It's a lot yeah. of expense. If you focus on sealing everything up really well, it's really quite effective and will probably be enough. Yeah, I agree. So the room, uh, the room directly be beside his home theater area is where the furnace and water heater and such will go. He's concerned that uh, about noise from that room being audible in his theater and noise from his theater getting into the ducting and uh, spreading throughout his the rest of his house. He's thinking of installing a solid core door with weather stripping and a sealed jam at the bottom. Anything else worth doing to make that utility room as soundproof as possible? I don't think you can do that. Yeah, you need can't, to be you really, can't do that. really you careful can't. about code here. <laughs> Yeah, because I think if you install, I mean, if that's the door that goes, because if if it's the, I can't tell which room he's talking about. If he's talking about that little room, yeah. So the theater is in the lower left part of this left L shape, part of the thing. and there's one room directly to what would be the left of his theater. That's going to be the utility room. Yeah, I don't know that you can do that because I think you have to have like air that can go in there. Yeah, you can't, so you can't seal that thing off. It's primarily it's primarily if anything is gas powered, which right. most furnaces are going to be gas powered, but not necessarily it's possible but it is possible to have a utility room because normally you're required to have a louvered door so that the air can move right into that utility room and throughout the rest of your basement and essentially the rest of your house um that's normally the requirement it is possible to have a sealed utility room if you have full in and out venting to the exterior of your house and that actually means going all the way up through your attic because you are wow. not allowed to have any of that exhaust below your roof line. <laughs> so this wow. is not a trivial thing we're talking about. We're going to talk about from your basement all the way up through your attic, out the top of your house. That is the requirement. Um, so yeah, this is not impossible to do, but you really need to talk to. You got to talk to your contractor. Yeah, yeah. Plan this out you got to talk to your contractor about this. It, this is that's, yeah. You you yeah. can't just throw the sealed door in there and go oh great. Like no, that would be very likely against code. Yeah. And against code isn't always like, ooh, we're trying to make you do stuff we don't want to do. It's like, ooh, you don't have any place for these off gases to go, and now everybody in the house is dead. Yes. So, you know, no, this is a very it, serious very thing. Very serious thing. Yeah. So make sure you're you're paying attention to code. Yeah. So with the walls open, he has the opportunity to run some wires and electrical. Any special considerations he should make specific to his home theater area? Everywhere you think you're going to have a speaker or a wire run, and definitely wherever things are going back to your wherever your gear is going to be, conduit. Yes. Run some conduit so that you can pull string through it. So what is conduit? I mean, it's conduit. They call it's it Smurf tight. tube. It's usually blue. Yeah. I'd go for the one that's one inch diameter because then you can pull an HDMI cable through it. Yeah. So, and then uh, I would also consider running, uh, this is not something you could do probably, but you're an electrician, a couple of 20 amp circuits to your... To the front where okay, your where your front, gear is going to be. Where your gear is going to be, just in case you get a big old amp and plug it in. Yeah. yeah that's not really a necessity, but if it's going to be done anyway, like just say, hey, 
up here where my gear is going to be instead of running the 15 amp circuit as i'm sure you were going to have an electrical outlet wherever your equipment was going to be you may get a 20 amp circuit instead that's really not a huge cost increase so yeah, yeah. uh run uh you know something to every place that you think a subwoofer might be all four yep. corners would be nice he actually uh, ends up asking about that later so <laughs> okay well i'll skip that and then uh yeah that's pretty much it yep uh we, 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 okay yeah his wife really wants an entertainment unit as the front, uh, at the front as far as aesthetics go, but it will be custom made so the exact placement of shelving is completely up to him. Since he wants to go with SVS Ultra speakers up front, what sort of shelving would work best to hold the bookshelf uh, left, right, and center? So it's okay to put them fairly small cute cubbies or should they be as open as possible? Do not put them in cubbies. Do not. They are rear ported, those speakers, too. Put them in cubbies in any way, shape, or form. If you want something to go into a cubby, get an in wall speaker mm. and then build it into the cubby. You know, that's that's what you do. You don't put a bookshelf speaker, especially one that's rear ported, into a cubby. That's just asking for acoustic problems that we'll have to deal if with. If this there. is fully custom, can the backs of where the speaker is going to be, can that have some two inch thick insulation with some fabric over it? you know, essentially be an acoustic panel that would be behind yeah. the speaker. I don't see why it couldn't. Why not? Sure, like, why not? Why, why yeah. couldn't you do that? Um, right. You know, if this is fully custom, so that's something I would do. I would have the back of this. Center. I mean, wh why not the whole thing? Turn the whole thing into a panel. Um, you know, so you're going to have a, a fabric cover on the back of that entertainment unit instead. And then keep the shelves as open as you can. I mean, these speakers right. were essentially meant to go on stands out in the room, so give them as much. Probably a couple of can. feet into the room is what the yeah. idea was. Yeah. So keep that in mind mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing this. But yeah, you don't want to put them in cubbies. No. If your wife doesn't want to see them, you know, rethink your speaker options. Well, I mean, yeah, it's okay to have an open type of frame and then just have some speaker grill cloth that goes over the front to hide them visually. That's fine. Sure. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's also no reason to be sold on a speaker that is not going to be mm. is going to be compromised by your current idea of placement. You know, think of a speaker that is not going to be that way. I mean, look at these silhouettes that uh, Ted has. I know they're a lot <laughs> more expensive, a lot more than, expensive. Which, than which. You, but as an example, I mean, these are big old speakers that are on wall speakers that are really not that thick. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very large and they're very big, but they're not that thick. And if you had just a little panel in front of them just something to cover them up as they were mounted at, at the back of this thing your wife might be thrilled and you might mm. have a, a much better sound experience than what you're looking at here that being said there's plenty of options here i i, I see what he's got here it, 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 i mean i'm not a little confused by this bar what am i looking at here is that where the tv is going to be uh so the tv is going to be the black thing at the very front um and yeah. then those panel thingies that's where the speakers are going to be i'm a little confused uh, no, uh, well, so open. yeah so to the left and the right of the tv that's where the shelving will go he's like uh they kind of rendered it up with glass front panels which yeah. is actually kind of the the next question coming up here all right here yeah. we go again with the entertainment unit being custom should the shelving areas have glass covers wood covers or can be completely open clearly completely open i would go with not glass yeah not glass <laughs> don't do glass. uh in any in any form anywhere on this thing if, if you, you want to visually it. hide your equipment behind some of these because obviously the speaker's not going to take up all of the right, right, right. shelving so if you want to hide your equipment then uh maybe i i get <laughs> louvered wouldn't be a bad idea so that air can get in there and circulate um, that would visually hide it without blocking the airflow. So maybe some louvered panels or speaker grill cloth. Right, yeah. right. Again, with the entertainment being custom, should the show... Oh, I already said that. Uh, he's planning on making his own absorption panels using Wox, uh, Roxel. He figures he'll put them on the two, two side walls and a couple on the ceiling. There are plans for lighting sconces on the sidewall, though. Would it be okay to build the panels after the fact and just fit them between the sconces? Or should he make the positioning of the panels the priority and possibly even try to have the sconces on top of the panels somehow? Uh, well, you have options with that. Now, if you're yeah. thinking of sconces on the sides here, and I can see where he's, he's got them on the left side there. Yes. Uh, there's a picture on the right side, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But there's no reason if you're going to build a sconce, if you're going to have a sconce there, you could have it, in, as part of like a column, like a little, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be like a column, column, but just like a little built out section. And all of that could be insulation floor to ceiling. Mm. That's not a terrible idea. That being said, in in my mind, 
put the sconces up mm-hmm. and then figure out where you're going to put the panels. Yeah, because he said he's, he's making them himself, so they can be whatever dimensions you want. You could cut them yeah. to fit right around the sconces if you want. Like you, The world's your oyster as far as the shape and the size of these panels that you're making yeah. yourself. So, no, put the lighting where you want the lighting to be. We'll fit the panels around them later. That's not a big deal. Since this room is open and the front corners are taken up with an entertainment cabinet, what should you do in terms of base trapping? Well, any part of that cabinet that you can steal <laughs> away, shove it full of insulation and just throw some grill cloth over the front of it. Uh, how important will base trapping be in his open room and any other acoustic treatments he should be considering? First of all, I question whether or not you're ever going to get any panels on your ceiling. I think that's a, that's a nice idea. I think there's zero chance. Your wife's going to go, oh, we're not putting those things uh, up there yeah, for real. Make- panels that blend completely in as far as the color goes never happening rob but okay or you can and dress maybe them up your... so that they look like the lights you know you can have the light coming down from the perimeter of them you can make them look it's never cool. happening so what should you do with panels anywhere you can <laughs> okay anywhere you can in this open room yeah kinda, nice. i mean all you're trying to do is cut down any sort of echoing reverberation that's right so, it's going to be bouncing around so you yeah. see that picture you got on that sidewall right there uh-huh. that's a that's a panel printed panel that is a printed panel. And get some more. Hey, honey, I love art. Let's put some more art in here. I'm having it printed at this place. Let's get some more art. And anywhere you can put the panels, you should. Uh, it's a big room. Yes. It's open. Yes. Does that mean that you don't need base trapping? Absolutely not. As much as you can get. The more, the better. Yeah, because you'll yeah. never you'll never have enough for this room. Because <laughs> you'll never have enough. So whatever, wherever you can put it is a good idea. Uh, I have to scroll back down. Uh, he's pretty much going to be restricted to having his subwoofer somewhere in the front portion of his theater, most likely on the right side wall in front of the L-shaped couch. So between the entertainment unit on the front uh, wall and the couch. And possibly a similar position on the left side wall. So he has them both up front. Mm-hmm. He just wants to make sure he has an electrical outlet close to any position where a subwoofer might end up. So any of the places we think should be wired for subwoofer power. Well, I gotta be honest with you, dude. Those are not the best places for subwoofers. But, but this in is an L-shaped, L-shaped room, room, I mean, it's gonna you don't know. You're gonna be end up playing with the phase anyway. I'm not. I'm not super opposed to that. You're gonna end up having to play with the phase knob of one of them anyway. I mean, what else are you gonna do? Put it. Put it in the kitchenette. It. Yeah. Put it I'm by the bathroom. I mean, what else are you gonna do in here? <laughs> yeah. I'm. I'm really quite okay with that placement myself. It's going to take some phase knob playing. Yeah. How about around the corner <laughs> on the left side? So right where the, you know where that furnace door is, uh-huh. if that's where the furnace door is, yeah. around that corner putting uh putting a sub there might not be having an option of putting it there might be worthwhile. Maybe. What's that going to do though? Who knows? It's an L-shaped room. <laughs> I'm just right. looking at places where you could physically put something, right? <laughs> Yeah. The other place is, uh, oh, heck, dude. I mean, what about behind the couch? You see that there's that little seating area there, there with, is, that, yeah. uh, with that light? Put one right near there and then one. Possibly. One across the hall from it there where I just said. Maybe. Maybe an option Might there. work. Might work. Might so not. this we now have four <laughs> placements for options, right? All right. So essentially, the four corners of your theater area. Is what we wound yeah. up saying. Because I, mean, I don't if, think if we're just no one's going to let us put them anyplace else. If, because I can't yeah. see any place else we can put them. If we're just really. talking electrical outlets, I don't see how that could be objected to anyway. You're going to want, well, and, you're gonna want uh, outlets and, in those and, positions anyway. You're going to, and you have to run the R, 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 RG6 cable back there too, mm, no. right? For your for the subwoofer. Sure. But other than that, yeah. that's not that big of a deal. All right. Those are the places so essentially, I would yeah, Essentially, the four corners of your theater area. Lance. Yeah, that was one big question from that it dude. Was. Lance. Lance bought a 65-inch Sony X900E from Best Buy. They said that we would be getting a Dolby Vision uh, update via firmware, but then Sony themselves said that only the X930E uh, would be end up getting Dolby Vision. So what's the scoop? The scoop is the Best Buy guys will say anything to get you by TV. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were wrong. That's the scoop. They were wrong. That's the scoop. Yeah, they, they, they may have been willfully wrong or ignorantly wrong. Yes. Either way, they were wrong. That's what it comes down to. Uh, sorry. So he asks, should he upgrade to the X930E? The 930E is edge lit, while the, X- the 900E is full array. So he's concerned about flash lighting in the letterbox bars and blooming overall. Which set would be better? 
So the X900E I, has somewhere in the range of 40-ish local dimming zones. So it's not a ton of zones in that thing. But still, 40, 40 is not bad. But not, it's not bad. 65 inch? Is it 65 inch? 65 inch. That's still, that's not And the X900E, even though it is edge lit, has some of the better edge lit version of local dimming. Uh, and actually does My... get significantly brighter for HDR than the X900E does. But it, it does wow. have that thing where, like, if there, let's say you have a 2.35 to 1 movie, so it's got black bars at the top and bottom, and then there's a bright object that's close to one of those black bars, it absolutely does bleed into the black bar. On both of them, though. On both of them. I would, if it were me, what I would do is wait till after CES. And Maybe. then see what's coming out. I uh... Or... If the LG OLEDs are on sale, yeah, because uh, I mean, honestly, because to to get the X930E, you're into pretty darn close to OLED prices. Mm. Uh, and if you're worried about flash lighting in the black bars, what you want is an OLED because yeah, that's the one that want... ain't gonna have it. Or yeah. you've got to go all the way up to like Sony's Z9D that has you know over 600 local dimming zones and can keep the black bars black with no flash lighting because there's enough right. zones to do that. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, the x 900 e is a very nice set. It's not going to do Dolby Vision. It's still going to have flash lighting in the black bars. If those two things are deal breakers for you, I would upgrade, but I would upgrade to an OLED. So CES is happening now, he says, so he should maybe wait. He's like reading my mind. Yeah. Will we ever, will we be seeing 12-bit panels this year? And would those be worth waiting for or too expensive? I don't think we're going to see 12-bit panels. And if they were there, they'd be too expensive. And you can just wait. You uh, could. There's always going to be something it, better. There's, yeah. I don't see that. I, I, and we are, see, we are seeing this trend of a lot more full array local dimming sets from all the brands. They're doing that. Yeah. Because OLED's eating their lunch. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I agree. So... I, I don't see this as I see this as more of a lateral move, mm. honestly. I mean, I don't see it going. I don't see why you would spend this money. You know? I mean, honestly, if these are the, if Dolby Vision and the flashlighting thing are things that are concerning him, I would almost I would either go up to an OLED or I might go down to a Vizio. Right. Like price, price the, wise, I'm the, saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the Vizios do Dolby all... Vision at least, and they yeah. actually have more local dimming zones. That's what I was gonna say. They have more. They have more zones. Yeah. So <laughs> you're gonna get better. And yes, I know Sony's very good. I mean, oh I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the X900 e is a really nice TV. Yeah, I just don't. Uh, I don't see if this is the problems that you're having. I don't see that the 930 is gonna solve them for mm. you. You're just gonna be a little bit. It does get really bright for things. HDR, which is nice, but it definitely has the flash lighting and the black bars. So on the 900E, streaming content from YouTube and Sling TV looked worse than on his older 1080p LG Plasma. He thought that 4K TVs with all their fancy new tech and processing would look better uh, for these sources, not worse. Would professional calibration help? Uh, no. <laughs> that's, that's not a calibration. That's not it's your not colors being issue. an accurate issue. That's yeah, this is, a, this is yeah. that plasmas were substantively better than <laughs> all this other well, stuff and that's actually, out in LCDs. you were... If, if there was any upscaling going on, you were creating fewer pixels for 1080p than you are now. Yeah. You're having to create a whole lot more pixels to get to 4K. I mean, th remember when everybody started getting flat panels, but a lot of people were still watching VHS? And they're like, VHS looks so bad. It didn't look this bad on my old tube TV. What the heck happened? Right. I got a way better flat panel. Why does VHS look like unwatchable now? It's like, well. Because it's unwatchable. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason you noticed it before because you had like a terrible set and you, everything yeah. was the same bum out of crappy. So, yes. You, you, so there's a lot of things going on here, but the, the, none I mean, of them Low are quality that. sources, there's so much upscaling that's having to go on. It's actually yeah. more of a challenge to make a low quality source into 8 million pixels than it was to make it into two. So unfortunately, yeah, that's it's uh, it's the low quality source is the problem. So he'd like to play at 4K video on his HTPC, but his older core i3 rig is chugging and it's basically unplayable. Should he upgrade to a KB Lake CPU, upgrade his graphics card or both? Well, he, it sounds like he wants... Dolby Vision and like all of the bells and whistles. Mm. So, I mean, you need the KB Lake, right, to get the the for anything that has any DRM. H 
DRM on Which it. is your Netflix, your Amazon, your Voodoo, so, your actual Ultra HD Blu-ray discs if you want to play them, your iTunes. But he can get 4K out of like an NVIDIA Shield and mm -hmm. all the rest. Uh, like I think it does the Dolby Visions and all the rest of the stuff no, too, right? No, NVIDIA Shield doesn't do Dolby Vision, but neither does a Windows 10 PC. Right. That doesn't do Dolby Vision either. All right. So what's the solution? So if you want a home theater PC, I mean, I would, I would absolutely say get a KB Lake processor and one of the motherboards right. that supports this DRM stuff. Because, I mean, maybe he's only downloading stuff in 4K. That could be the case. And it doesn't have any DRM. But what if you just want to watch Netflix off the darn thing one day? You know? I mean, that's, yeah. that's not an unlikely scenario in my opinion. So the graphics card, it can do it for some of them. But if you get the KB Lake processor, then then you're set. So you're set, just, right? Just but how that. how much are those things? I feel like they must be super expensive. I never well, really you do actually need a Core i5, by the way. Okay. The Core i3s don't support it, the current ones. So you do actually need a Core i5. So you're looking in the two hundred and fifty dollar range. Hmm. Yeah. There are some that are you, you can find them for less, but if you hmm. sort of think that in your head, you're in the ballpark. Andrew. Andrew is planning out his second home theater build. The room will be fully light controlled, rectangular, and enclosed. Yay. 20 <laughs> feet long, 13 feet wide, and 7 feet high. Do a bulkhead, and he's going to install a drop ceiling, uh, I guess, to line up Even with Even with the bulkhead, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. The entrance door will be on the right uh, wall near the front of the theater, and there will be a door in the middle of the back wall leading to the furnace room. Again, don't put a solid core door and, in And now I'm a little <laughs> bit worried is... Because, okay, so yeah, I mean, when, this wasn't even one of his questions, but this furnace room thing. Yeah, supposed to be twice a, in one one podcast. Supposed to be a louver door, and because the only uh, exit from that furnace room door is into your theater, that means your theater has to have an air has return have into yeah. the rest of the basement, too. So you have to have a louver door. Well, I mean, if the rest of the space, but well, it says living room for the and a bedroom for the rest of the basement, okay, so yep. uh, you may have a little, a little bit of an issue here, my friend. But we let's let's go on. Yeah. Well, uh, we just. Be, but I mean, if this is planning stage type stuff, yeah, um, you need to talk to your uh, whoever is going to help you build this thing. Yeah, contractor or whatever. Yeah, and say, listen, what's the what's my air issues here? Yeah. Because if you can do uh, the whole air is brought in directly from outside, because it looks like that furnace room is on an exterior wall, so it can get its fresh air supply directly from outside, then it could exhaust all the way up through your attic. It, it can be done. It's just, if you didn't budget for that, that could be a thing. That's a, that's a, that's a non-insignificant <laughs> right? price. Yeah. All right, so check that out for sure. And then if that's the issue, you may have to move your home theater mm. to a different place, which, you know, hey, there's a bedroom. There's a bedroom. There. There's switch, a living room. <laughs> sw switch the bedroom and the home theater, right. and then somebody lives right next to the furnace, yeah. whoever, whatever child you don't like that much. Uh, and, uh, okay. Andrew wants two rows of seats, a 7.2.4 speaker configuration, and a projection setup. Okay. Yeah. Scrolling down past all these things. Now, I'm going to say that the first thing that struck me when I saw these images is that those chairs are way too close together. Yes, although that work. isn't to scale. That's not it's to scale. It's definitely I, not I, to scale. I understand yeah. that. But I, I want everybody to know that we're all thinking the same thing. The, the, yes, how, how, how would you is, walk? Nobody the sits in the row. back row has any legs. That, yeah. So <laughs> there's that. So he already owns 11 speakers, but he needs a new receiver, screen, and projector. He's in Canada, so he needs options that are available to him. He was thinking of getting a Denon AVR X4400H, a silver ticket 120-inch screen, and either an Optima UD, I'm sorry, UHD60 or Epson HC4000 projector. What do we think of these choices? We have recommendations for different choices that won't cost more, and what is a good, cheap two-channel amp that he could add to the Denon so that he can power all 11 speakers? Uh, Denon silver ticket. Optima, Epson. I don't know about the prices of the Optima, the Epson, but the Silver Tick and the Denon are both solid. Uh, oh, yeah. Those are both solid projectors as well, as far as I know. I mean, uh, I would easily choose the Epson over the Optima. Yeah. Easily. Uh, I yeah. know that the Optima having actual 8 million pixels, because it's a wobbled 4 million pixel DLP chip instead of a wobbled 1080p chip, might sound enticing, but there, there's no competition in the black levels. And right. the Optima can't do the wide color. It's Rec. 709 only. Right. So the Epson has better black levels. 
yes, it's a 1080p wobble panel, but I really don't care about that. And it has the wider color. I would easily choose the Epson. Plus, the Epson has fully motorized lens. Uh, the Optima has nothing even close to that. I don't think the Optima has even any lens shift. So, easy choice for me out of those two. All right. Epson 4000. So what about an amp? Because I don't yeah. know what's available in Canada. You so. you can get the uh, audio source, the Amp 100 from Amazon.ca. You know, I'm clicking on this link. That thing looks a lot like my amp. Like oh, exactly. Oh, the, the date like and the audio amp. source were really similar. They're not identical, but they are really similar. the The audio source was the one that w I always recommended. Then the Dayton was a little bit cheaper, but then now the that Dayton is gone. The one that you have, the Class AB one, is gone. Dude, it looks exactly <laughs> the same. I am not lying. There is a balance button on the left. Yeah. There is a volume on the right. There is A, B speaker buttons, and there's a power button. It looks exactly... Let me look at the back. It's exactly the same. Shut up. This is the same amp. <laughs> this is the same amp. It's the same. In any case, audio source amp 100 from Amazon.ca will totally get the job done. All right. It's about 150 bucks Canadian, right? That's right. So he's planning a seating distance of 13 feet uh, for the primary row, and he would like to have a second row of seats behind that. Does the 220-inch... 120 inch screen size makes sense for that and would we recommend he go with a 16 by 9 or a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio screen his main usage will be movies 16 by 9 i'm saying it we're first gonna, we're gonna deb debate that again possibly 16 by 9 don't listen to rob he's a crazy person i mean i want i want 16 by 9 too i just want i want huge 16 by 9 um I think I don't understand how that's different than sixteen by nine. Just get a big sixteen by nine. I just want HD TV to be smaller than cinema. That's, that's the ridiculous only to have something smaller just because you want HD TV to be different. You're making Daisy upset. Mm. It's well, what should he get? Sixteen by nine. Crazy. We're both going to say sixteen by nine. Get a sixteen. Yes. By nine. 16 by 9. Yeah. Um, okay, so the 120-inch size, I think, makes a lot of sense for the room size. The, the thing I would change is your seating distance. Because um, if you are 13 feet, this 20 foot long, yeah. So it only leaves you seven feet behind there. You That's need not room for it, a second row of seats. If it ends up wall. where you have yeah. this this furnace room door on the back wall, you need a three foot walkway. Yeah. So then that means the back of your second row is only four feet behind the back of your front row. That that's not enough. I would move your front row, your primary row, a foot and a half, two feet closer, eleven, eleven and a half feet. Yeah. Uh, that still puts you behind the very middle of your room acoustically. So that's okay. Yeah. It gives you the five and a half foot difference between the back of the front row and the back of the back row, which gives you enough leg room for that back row. It leaves you the three foot walkway behind the yeah. back row. And if you stick with 120 inch size, now you've got something in the 41 to 43 degree field of view with that screen size. Yeah. To me that all, I mean, we're talking about moving seats, which I don't think are secured to the floor. So that, that should be doable. Right. <laughs> So he says if he goes with the Optima, it has a 15% vertical lens offset. Would yeah. that be optimal height for my... No, you don't, don't get that. Don't get the Optima. Get the, get the Epson. It's got the piles of lens shift and it's motorized. So, uh, yeah. So don't the reason he wants the Optima because it's true 4K, is that the deal? Yeah. Is that what is, is yeah. he's waiting for? Okay. I'm sure of yeah. it. Yeah. Don't get that. Uh, what would be the best height at which to mount the surround and surround back speakers? Are you going to have a riser? Because mm. that's the, that's the... You can't answer the surround back questions for sure so that every person's ears in the 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 theater has a line of sight to the speaker that's on their side yep does that make sense yep okay uh if your primary row of seats is where you're gonna sit mm -hmm. you want them to be a little bit behind that row and high enough for everybody's ears if you want uh if you're going to sit primarily in the second row, then you can do that back there, though I don't think I would necessarily recommend sitting back there. Or you can have two sets, one for each row, mm. or you can put them smack dab in the middle or, you know, some variation thereof. So basically not in front of you and not uh, just high enough so that everybody's ears has a line of sight. Yeah, which in general is going to be about a, a foot, foot above foot, foot your head. Foot, foot and a half above your head. That's... Yeah, mine's a little be. higher than that. I think I got mine about a f two feet above the yep. back of my couch. Which will also work just fine. Yeah. So, you know, just what worked aesthetically for my room. Yeah. So I, it's a foot a or two higher than your head. So he owns a pair of Klipsch in-wall speakers and a pair of Klipsch RS-42 
bipole speakers. Which pair should you use as surrounds and which pair should you use as surround backs? Well, you should not use the bipole surround uh, speakers as surround backs. Correct. Uh, never in the history of surround backs has anybody thought that that was a good idea. So the prevailing wisdom from like 10 years ago or maybe seven years ago was bipole, dipole speakers for your surrounds mm -hmm. and monopole or direct firing speakers for your surround backs. Now they want direct firing speakers for everything. But, but bipoles us, aren't really that. They're not dipoles. You're not getting that weird yeah. null and diffusion thing. They're just like so, really wide dispersion. So they're fine. Yeah, they're fine. And that's what I have in my side surrounds because that's the speakers I got. And I'm in the same boat that you are. So you want your bipole speakers as your surrounds in your direct firing as your surround backs. Correct. So he has a 6.5 inch in ceiling speakers for his top front and top rear positions. If he mounts the top front left and top rear left inside of the bulkhead that runs the length of the left side of the room they're very very close to the cold air return duct so okay whatever so he's inside worried the bulkhead yeah so if he's worried that it, uh, that might ruin any chance of soundproofing his theater if he mounts them outside the bulkhead they'll be five feet away from the left wall uh, the bulkhead is apparently very wide. So if he makes them symmetrical, the left and right overhead speakers will only be three feet apart. What should <laughs> he do? That's too what... close together overhead. That... Yeah, that's way too close together. Uh, you're going to have to go into the dr the bulkhead. So or is that go on ceiling. Yeah, you know, why don't you go on ceiling? You could do that. Yeah. For those. You know, you're going to be awfully close to them. They're only seven feet. Mm -hmm. your, your ceiling's over seven feet. Get like the the, the itty bitty birds, the baby birds. Little what birds. What do they call it? The little birds. Little birds. Get the Focal little birds because they're smaller. Or uh, an HT Super Zero, mm -hmm. something small. Yes. And use those as your your uh, your overhead speakers. Because I agree, going into that bulkhead, cutting holes in there, that is right next to an air return. Yeah, I, I don't even know if you'd have room to put the backer boxes on there. Uh, that's what I was going to say. The only you thing know. you could do is put a backer box and, like, stuff it. Make sure it's yeah. really well But there know, might physically just it. not be the room to do it. And if that if that's the case, you got to go on ceiling, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So the plan is put to put up a single layer of 5 8 inch drywall on the exterior wall and two layers of drywall with green glue on all the interior walls. And he's going to insulate above the T-bar ceiling. Most of the rest of the basement will have a T-bar ceiling too. So is the double drywall and green glue even worth it? Or could he save some money and just use basic construction and get the same results as far as soundproofing goes? Yeah, see, this is an interesting one. If you talk to soundproofingcompany.com, they are not fans of the drop ceilings. Um, right. Which is somewhere where I respectfully disagree because I, I, in general, they're correct. I mean, if you do a traditional drop tile ceiling, that's not soundproof at all you do need to do the specialized drop tile ceiling with the full acoustic tiles that are heavier and foam and kind of thick, possibly even line above them with vinyl uh, so that you have a continuous surface mm. and then insulate above that. And if you do all that, it's pretty good. It's pretty good for your soundproofing. It's really not bad. So I respectfully disagree with their drop tile ceilings are always bad. It's like, no, you, you just have to do the specialized, considerably more costly version of it, admittedly. Um, you know, it is a consideration. Well, I mean, again, co contact the, the the soundproofing company. Yeah. Figure out. You know, you're gonna you're gonna need to figure out what the cost difference is there. Yeah. Too. You know, if you're gonna do the more expensive drop ceiling, how much is that gonna cost versus getting a cheaper drop ceiling and doing the green the green glue mm. stuff? Well, because I mean, the thing is, if if this drop tile ceiling is sort of like you know, you're gonna have the joist bays, right? Mm -hmm. So that if if the air can get up there and then escape out into the rest of the basement. That's why he's like, is there any point in soundproofing this wall if the sound's just going to escape up into the ceiling, go through the yeah. joist bays and into the rest of the basement, which is a completely valid question. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what's going to happen too. I yeah, mean, so I mean, it uh, really, it what it means is that the drop tile ceiling in your theater really needs to be a soundproof specialized drop tile ceiling, which is going to cost you considerably more than a just your standard drop tile ceiling. If you're going to put the money anywhere, that's actually where you need to put it more than anything is making sure you get the specialized you know uh sound tiles and i would probably in this case suggest having that vinyl layer on top of it too hmm. something to think about byron byron has a denon avr x 4300h and it has spree outs for zone two zone three as well as heos built in i gotta be honest with you i didn't think we we're gonna get this far in the questions and you didn't think uh, we would get I to got... six 
I didn't think we'd get to six. I was so tired. I needed a nap. Okay. I had a very long day. And he wanted to create a four. I, I got to this question, read this question, went, this is far too complicated. Rob will do it. Uh, if you wanted to create a, a four zone setup, main theater zone, kitchen, dining room, and patio. So kitchen is one, dining room is one, and patio. Could you do all that just using the X4300H? So it's got three zones and HEOS. Yeah. The thing I don't know is if HEOS is its own zone. Does that count well, separately? Um, yeah, because, I mean, it's it's not as though if you send something to HEOS, you are forced to output that same source to zone two or zone three or the main zone. It can be its own independent output source. So you should be able to do you this. You should yes. be able to do this. Yes, you should. It should be. need some amps. Should be. But... Yeah, you're going to need external amps for this or self-powered speakers. Yes. Because you have to use the pre outs so, but yeah. Is it correct that all four zones could potentially play different music in each zone by using different built-in streaming services? Spotify in one zone, Tidal in zone two, Napster in zone three. Napster is still a thing? And tune in via Heos on, uh, in the fourth zone. I'm not certain. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not I, that's certain. why I read this yeah. question. I went, oh, it's too hard. I'm going to skip it and go take a nap. I would be so, very interested to actually know if that... I, I, I think you sh you should be able to because I, you can you, know, I, you can definitely play two different sources from two from like say your main zone and zone two you can absolutely play two different. The sources. problem is that can you can you stream more than one thing with the receiver yeah. at the same time and that's the question I don't know the answer to. Yeah, because and... it it, it depends because I think they identify all of those simply as network. Yes, I th I don't think there. I don't think each streaming service is identified as a separate source. I think all of them are cumulatively under the network source. So I my don't... guess is that you could stream one, and then the other three zones would have to be something you plug in. Something you plugged in. Yeah. Yes. the Which, plugging in is not going to be an issue. I mean, you could, could you could definitely plug do plug Chromecast audios in, and there sure. you go. You know, now now you got your streaming sources that way. Work is done. That's right. Yeah. Whenever he's playing something in uh, the second zone, third zone, or HEOS, the source itself needs to be outputting two channel stereo. Is that correct? Yes. There's no way to have sound playing, uh, surround sound playing in the main zone and also have that same source playing in one of the other zones or via HEOS at the same time. Is that correct? Yes, unfortunately. That is, that is, yeah. that is correct. But yes. you can have stereo playing in all of the zones, including the main zone. And the main zone can be up mixing that using the Dolby Surround up mixer, you know, stereo up mixing it. So if you're talking about playing, a, you know, a hockey game or a football game or something, and you just want to have that same audio throughout the house, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's going to be originally stereo in the main zone too, but that's not really the end of the world. Yeah, you can use your stereo. Yeah. Your you just have to, you'd you have to set that. your cable box to output stereo for that. Yeah, that'd be good. So Byron is moving to Virginia, which we found out last week in our hangout after party. And his new landlord sent some pictures of the room Byron intends to use as his new home theater. So the furniture and layout in the photos that we're showing on our YouTube channel right now. Uh, well, not right now, but will be. When oh, it's now. It's happening it. now. These are not Byron's stuff, but this is going to be his room. Yeah. So right now there's a large window and patio doors in the back wall with a tv opposite the windows if byron keeps that orientation he figures he'll use 5.4 he's already got four subwoofers he does 5.4.4 configuration but he's considering rotating the setup 90 degrees so the seats would face the fireplace if he does that he'd have a projection screen that can roll down in front of the fireplace and he could fit a 7.4.4 speaker setup what orientation would we recommend and what suggestions we have for let setting up his room how would we do it dude you need some curtains this place is straight up bright <laughs> well it's <laughs> like he said, it's this isn't he. It's not his design yet. That's so. Yeah. Okay. So we in the picture where you can see the fireplace, mm -hmm. you can see the TV on the right. Yes. Uh, I am a fan of uh dropping a screen down on top of that. Oh that, yeah. If that's yeah. an option, heck yeah. Set this that's, room that's, up lengthwise. Screen comes down in front of the fireplace. Seven dot four dot four. Heck yeah. And you want some blackout curtains over the windows and the patio Do door because projection. Is he renting up. or buying? I thought he was buying. Am I wrong? I'm not certain. I, I mean, he remember. said landlord, so that makes me think rental. It's got to be renting. It's got to be lease. renting. In which it might case, be lease. You know. Yeah, putting some holes in the ceiling might not be everybody's favorite mm. thing. You're going to need a big old... There's a lot of wood in here, too. So you're going to need some... He's already got room treatments. I know that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he'll be setting those up. Uh, you're going to need a big, nice, thick rug with a th thick pad underneath it. That would be nice. Uh, you're also going to need to invite your neighbors over all the time for movie <laughs> night because they're not going to be real happy with all your subs. 
but yeah, I, I like the idea of th dropping a, a, a screen down in front of oh, now. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about uh, fireplaces and screens, so well, you know, don't have it you know, on while the screen is yeah. down. That ain't a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. So he still has his and then uh, X four thousand. Could he potentially use this to add matrix front wide speakers? Uh, should he do this? I would use your Denon. I would use your Denon as the amp for your your X forty three hundred that you're gonna if you're gonna have. You do need at zones. least two external yeah. channels. Yeah. I don't. What matrix front wide? Speakers? Well, because it how, would how, be using DTS Neo X, so it's not discrete front wides from Atmos. Right. You'd be matrixing this out, which would mean that you would actually want to take the zone two HDMI output, which would then steal one of your zones. So, yeah, no, you wanted four zones. Now you got three. Mm -hmm. You'd want to take the zone two HDMI output from your X4300H, feed that HDMI signal to your H X4000 because you want the front left right and the surround left right speakers to all be coming from the X4000 because some of those sounds are being steered into the front wides and you don't want duplicate sounds that were happening in the X4300 to then be not taken out of what it should be playing out of the front wide positions. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah, so you'd end up losing a zone. Plus, if you're doing Dolby Vision, because I'm pretty sure he has a Vizio that has uh, Dolby Vision. Uh, yeah, he does, yeah. That might create problems when you're trying to feed the X4000 with HDMI, so you probably need an HD Fury on top of this. <laughs> it's it a lot of problems. You know what? Starts. Just buy, just wait for the new receivers. Wait for the flagships, <laughs> yeah. Spend $5,000 on one of the new flagships. Wait for the flagships and then wait for a couple of years for them to show up at Accessories for Less mm. and then buy it for like $2. As much as I like front wides, this is a bit of a thing you're proposing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I can't. I, the only person who cares about front wides. That's not true. I front think front wides are a good idea. <laughs> I just have never experienced them, and I'm out of speakers, <laughs> unlike you. Mark. Mark's two channel listening room is roughly 12 by 15, and he sits 11 feet uh, from his pair of speakers. He's been using a pair of NHT Super Zeros with an Energy EPS 100 sub, and he likes a neutral sound, but they don't exactly rec uh, recreate a live concert type of experience. He'd like to upgrade to a speaker setup that will. I am actually not surprised that 11 feet away from Super Zeros is not giving you that concert-like yep. experience. But, hey. And I don't blame you, you for wanting it because, hey, if this uh, is a two-channel music setup. You're like, I want to be at a concert. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree. So he has a budget of about 2500 bucks. He feels his energy subwoofer is already sufficient and he only cares about his one seating position. So he wants to spend that budget or less on a new pair of speakers, a new amplifier, potentially a new preamp if we think he should, and then any necessary stands as well as a new CD player. I, I gotta say, I, I'm a little confused by this, but room treatments are not part of the plan right now, although he might consider adding some later. Okay. Why does he want all this new stuff? Does he not have any of it? Or he just wants to upgrade everything? I think he just I, wants to upgrade everything. That's what it feels all right. like. I, I, that's, why, that's what it feels like from this question as well. I'm going to say, sir, just spend it on speakers. Uh, I don't possibly, see any, yeah. I don't see any reason for you to upgrade your amp. Well, I don't know uh, what amp he has, though. Maybe it's some, like, 3-watt tube amp or something. It could be. Okay. So maybe there's a reason to upgrade your amp. Uh, I don't see any reason for you to upgrade your preamp. If it's working, you're listening to stereo. It's not like that has changed in the last bajillion Except years. the one he has doesn't have bass management, so... Uh, that's true as well, but we'll yeah. get to that in a second. Uh, and then CD players, of course. I mean, if all you're doing is listening to CDs, mm. you know, as long yeah, as you're not going, yeah. like, like RCA outs on that thing, <laughs> you should be... Well, he you... is because the, the preamp that he has oh, is analog be, only. Yeah. So he might be thinking, oh, I need a good analog CD player if he keeps his current preamp. Right. Which is right. telegraphing what my answer is going to be about my the preamp situation. So his preamp is a Macintosh C28. What are our, our opinions of that unit, and should he continue to use it or buy something else? In this email, he mentions potentially spending $300 to have Macintosh and his, uh, and his interconnects serviced. Is that a good use of his budget? No. No. And that what mouth, are they are that they going to give him a oil and lube? What are they doing? Well, that Macintosh they, is known do? for having a noisy volume dial, which can be serviced, but that... That, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but interconnects? interconnects? How do you service interconnects? I don't know where you he's... You take a little... You just, just polish him a little bit? Put a little little oil on there? That's... I mean, it doesn't going kind to of change the electrical... Either it's fast in the signal or it's not. Okay, whoever said they were going to do this for you, yeah. just say no. 
because this person's trying to rip you off I, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, well, it's coming up later, but I don't know. Maybe we'll skip to it because it, what he's like, I just want you to get something that has base management and can take a digital signal. I, I want you to have that because then it doesn't matter what your CD player is. It could be the cheapest. Yeah, yeah. Although I do, I would, I would assume in a dedicated listening room, you'd want a CD player that isn't itself noisy, and the really cheap ones often are. You know, yeah, like just, the, the literally spinning, just the spinning you, disc you, is noisy. You can hear it spinning, yeah. right? <laughs> All right, but let's get into the speaker. Yeah. So what type, uh, a new pair of speakers should he buy, keeping in mind that his, oh, his goal is to recreate a live concert type experience that his NHT Super Zeros are not providing? First of all, do not sell those speakers. Keep those speakers oh, yeah, for when yeah. you decide that surround is a good thing that you're going to want to try out. And these are going to be perfect for surround mm. in this room if you ever decide to go that way. You may never, but that's okay. You will at least have them on hand and the Super Zeros are a great speaker. Uh, all right, so... 2500 bucks is mm -hmm. a goodly amount of money for a pair of speakers. I would love uh, to recommend anything from uh, uh, Aperion would be good. Okay. The Varus Grand Towers. I think this guy would love towers. I'll be honest with you. I don't think he necessarily needs them, mm. but I think he would love them. I think this is something that would be right in, right in his uh, up his alley. And uh, right now, because I just looked them up, they are uh, is that I, each or is it they're listed they're back, as each? They're backward, so they are eleven fifty nine each. Ooh, they're currently so you're spending almost the out. entire budget. Almost Just the entire on budget speakers. on the towers. But if you're like, I want to save some of the budget, you can get some of the bookshelves. Mm -hmm. And I think that the bookshelves would be okay in here as well. Yeah, 11 so that, feet away. That should be fine. The Varus Grand Twos or Two Grand or yeah. Ver Two Varus. I can never remember what order they put those. Varus two, two Grand is what they said. Yeah. So those would be, I think, a good choice for you. Uh, the the SVS uh, uh, Ultimate Ultras? Line or whatever it is. Ultras. The Ultras would be good as well um well how much are your speakers your speakers are a lot more than this right yeah yeah 1450 a pair for the sierra twos ascend acoustic that, sierra twos that's that, that seems like a real good choice right is, there that is certainly possible now i really focused on the concert like okay and i was thinking maybe he does have a fairly low powered amp or he's gonna end up with one okay okay in which case power sound audios mt 110s are 1350 for a pair. Uh -huh. They're big. They're uh -huh. ugly. Uh -huh. But they sound like a concert. <laughs> okay. They're efficient, 95 dB efficient, horn loaded, 10 inch driver, and they will belt it out like you are at a live concert with okay. very low power. So they're not going to win I'm any looks. I'm looking at those speakers right now. Those are some god-awful speakers. Those are some <laughs> ugly, are ugly speakers. Ugly speakers. But yes. if all you care about is the sound, and I think that's the case here, uh, yeah, that, that could definitely be a choice now. When was the last time you were at a concert and you saw pretty speakers? Yeah. They don't exist. <laughs> They're all ugly horn-loaded speakers. Now, so. Kef's LS50s, which go for $1,500 a pair, and they're actually on those sale right now. Those are fantastic speakers. Those are really good speakers. Those are really those good. Are really they're little bookshelves, concentric drivers. Uh, Clint DeBoer has them yeah. in his office. He absolutely loves them. He's and well he should buy them. Yes. Yeah. Um, those are very nice so all, I was always thinking fifteen hundred dollars a pair because I wanted to get you a, a new preamp and amp. Um, okay. So uh, Philharmonic Audio would be another alternative. Uh, those use the same RAL or not the same, but a similar RAL ribbon tweeter as the Sierra Twos. So they have a larger three-way bookshelf model uh, that goes okay. for thirteen fifty a pair. So these are all very similar price ranges. Uh, yeah, the Power Sound Audio ones are by far the most efficient. So if you have little amplifier power, but you want them to play concert loud, they can do it. They're just the, the ugliest of all of them. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, th there's some options there, but I think you'd be happy with any of those. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, other brands you can kind of look at. You could look at Salk. Sure. Uh, Salk Audio is pretty good. Um We already mentioned Kef. We already mentioned... I felt like a hair in my face. Uh, nothing else popping into my head right now. I'll, yeah. I, if something else comes up, I'll think about it. So what speaker stand should he go with uh, if the speakers are bookshelves? And we always recommend the same stands. Mm -hmm. And it's the one I'm literally using right now mm -hmm. to hold this computer up while I am doing this podcast. And it's a Stannis, Stannis stand. Now, I like, so. I like either the Natural, which is their MDF stands, or their Steel series, which are the Steel stands. I'm using the Steel stands. Steel stand, I yeah. like the Steel stands. They're plenty heavy. I just took yeah. the feet off the bottom 
I mean, I, they, yep. I, there's no reason to have them. Yep. They sit nice on the. And if you want them to be heavier, you can fill them with, you know, whatever kitty sand litter or whatever. Kitty, kitty litter is the best. Uh, and uh, lastly, no, 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 lastly, yes. Which amplifier would would he like now? Yeah. You're not gonna like what we're about to say. Possibly and I, 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 I want you to know that we're saying this is coming from a place of love, but uh, separates for some time were uh, theoretically superior to receivers in certain ways. That has gone the way of the dodo bird. That does no, that no longer exists. Uh, separates are uh, nice. They are sometimes necessary. Mm -hmm. They are. I can very rarely think of a situation where they are necessary when you're sitting 11 feet away from a speaker. Mm. Especially when it's just two. Just two of them. So I, I don't see the need for you to have separates. So we're going to suggest an amplifier that is a receiver, mm -hmm. and then you do not have to buy an amplifier, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because you could use that. There is literally no speaker that we have recommended, nor very many speakers that we could even think of that 11 feet away from just driving two of them any receiver on the market will have a problem powering it. Yes, and the one it, we're going to suggest is a, a genuine into two channels simultaneously, yeah. 105 watts, and you you do have a subwoofer taking off the lowest base from which any makes of these it even speakers, easier which makes it for even the, easier. Yeah. So this is a lot of power. You're going to have full base management. You're going to have uh, digital inputs. And if you do I, ever want to expand a surround sound for your speakers, like just throw in your NHT Super Zeros as surrounds, you could do that now too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the other thing, I want to go back to what your current setup was. You currently have a stereo preamp, mm -hmm. some sort of amplifier that we're not sure what mm -hmm. it is, NHT Super Zeros and a subwoofer. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you're using the subwoofer as your crossover for your NHT Super Zeros, which you might be, I don't mm -hmm. know about that sub. If very few have high pass filtered outputs. Some did, it, but very few. Basically, the NHTs are getting full range. Yeah. And, and the sub is getting full range, but the sub, of course, is only playing what you tell it to play based on where you set its crossover. So, you know, you are actually putting those speakers at a disadvantage by mm -hmm. not doing bass management. They are going to, you know, unless they're within their own crossover inside, unless they roll themselves off, which they may, they are going to try to play lower than it's than they are really capable of playing. And it's quite possible that some of what you're not liking about what you're hearing from them is because they are distorting at lower levels where they shouldn't be Could playing be. at all. Yeah. So having a receiver do a crossover for you so that your speakers are only playing what they're good at and letting the subwoofer do everything else will overall enhance your your speaker, your, your, your listening experience. So getting this receiver with the space management, the idea here is let the speaker do what the speaker's good at let the subwoofer do that the subwoofer's do at, good at, and let the, the receiver tell what to do, you know, what to do. Don't worry about digital to analog conversion. Don't worry about keeping everything in the analog domain. That doesn't matter. The digital to analog stuff, that... Well, you just need to see these anyway, so he's fine with digital. That's not a... Yeah, thing. It, it, we're just going to take it digital from the, 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 the CD player into the receiver. The receiver will do the base management in the digital domain, and then... And then out it goes analog to the way that it should be. So which which receiver? I mean, basically anything with uh, multi-QXT32 yeah. would be what I'd recommend. I want you to so. get the, the least expensive receiver that offers Odyssey multi-QXT32, which is the Denon AVR X3300 double. You can get it from $500 from Accessories for Less right now. So if you get okay. the $1,500 speakers that we're recommending, this is $500. You still have $500 left in your budget for a CD player uh, and stands. Totally. Uh, it should fit. So yeah, X3300W from Denon. Accessories for less, 500 bucks. And the CD player. Uh, yeah. I'm going to make an off-the-wall recommendation. It's actually kind of hard to find a standalone CD player these days. Now, they exist. And uh, buying them used, I think, uh, or on AudioGon or eBay or whatever, is probably a good choice for you. Just to get a standalone CD player, like a something that was flagship, you know, ten years ago. It's not like whatever's coming out of that CD player has changed in the last ten years. There's still CDs. There's still now, if you have an SACD collection or a DVDA or something like that. Well, then 
you know, you may need a specialty player, but there's plenty of them out there that are used and that people still have. I've got a, a Denon DVD something, something, something that was its flagship at a time that's sitting in the box and I'm not doing anything with. Why? <laughs> what am I going to do with it? When's the last time I play a CD in my home theater? The last time I did a speaker test. The, l- the last time I played a CD in my sp- my home theater for pleasure was never <laughs> I, I have not done it since i moved into this house so so i'm gonna make an off the wall recommendation i'm gonna suggest getting a sony udp x800 ultra hd blu-ray player because seems a bit excessive rob well they're 200 bucks uh all right and they play essay cds okay it plays dvd audio okay if you ever want to throw a tv in here it'll play ultra hd blu-rays and blu-rays and dvds um, you can use the HDMI output to connect to the Denon because now you're going to have an HDMI connection. Like, it's a great player. It's it's nice build quality. The disk drive is pretty quiet. It loads disks really fast. I'm like, it's, it's a great player. It's a great disk player. Yeah. Uh, you could do that, I suppose. You could do that. Though, I mean, the Let HDMI me. connection is nice, but if all you can do is listen to CDs, optical is just fine. Uh, well, sure, yeah. <laughs> you know? so, are you going to do essay CDs? Why not? HDMI. Michael. This is our, maybe our last, maybe not. Jeez, we're Michael not even halfway, and, man. Dude, we are way more than halfway. Look no, at how far down this questions. list. I don't care about that. The, the, those questions were the long ones. <laughs> Michael and his wife bought a whole bunch of new home theater stuff over Christmas. They now have a Vizio m70 e3 television xbox one x apple tv 4k and they're still using their older ps4 and Com- comcast cable box his new receiver is a denon avr s 920w from accessories for less michael just wants to make sure he's getting the most out of his new tv and his new 4k sources so can we offer him any settings and setup tips to make sure he isn't missing out on any performance okay let me just go back up okay the tv mm-hmm Put it on uh, whatever the warm setting is or theater mode or something like that. They actually and have then... ones labeled calibrated dark and calibrated bright. Uh, Do calibrated dark. Calibrated dark <laughs> would be the most accurate possible. But if your room yeah. is a little bit brighter, there's nothing wrong with calibrated bright. That's okay to use. They just basically changed the gamma setting on that. It's really all they did. So I don't know much about the Xbox One S, uh, as far as uh, One X, as far as setting it up. But you will have to go into the audio settings, and there's two places for it, uh, and set it to. Well, after it does, it, it's a bajillion updates. Uh, it, set it to uh, Bitstream out mm-hmm. in Dolby Atmos. There is an Atmos app that you can download, and I think it will It'll actually prompt you to download, you to download it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it requires you to do that. So, and then, then you can test that out. And then you think you go back. There's another place in there in the for disc the disc and Blu-ray settings, where you'll also have to select. You have to tell it, it let my out. AV receiver decode audio. Yeah, yeah. Which actually uh, it prompts you to do too. Uh, so yeah, Xbox f- One X is that's okay. 4K. Uh, I don't know the Apple 4K. The cam, the Comcast cable box. You should go into the video settings, the audio settings, Bitstream, of course, if it can. Uh, audio settings. Uh, I mean, video settings. I'd be honest with you. I, if there's a native, just like give it to me the way you got it. I would do that. Uh, but a lot of times you can't. So uh, what I try. I usually kind of played with it. I usually tried the whatever the highest was, which is usually 1080p. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, I, I would a lot of times settle on the 1080i and let my uh, display do the deinterlacing. It depended on your display, and it depends on uh, what signal you're getting from Comcast. So you might have to play with that one a little bit. I don't know the other ones. Um, so over at uh, Ratings, which is how they say it, it's like R-Tings, but over there. Oh, uh, the they have their uh, their settings for the Vizio M series that you have. So you can just okay. basically copy those because they're fine. Um, and you don't have to do much. It's almost completely accurate right out of the box. Um, right. Yeah, Xbox One X. Uh, it, honestly, that'll auto-detect your video settings just fine. The uh, yep. S920 passes through all HDR and 4K formats, so no problems there. And then the audio, yeah, just make sure that you set it to Atmos Bitstream Output. Uh, for the Apple TV 4K, that I, would, be different. I would recommend following CNET's recommended setup because I don't like the whole everything is shown to you at 60 frames per second in HDR, even when the original signal was nothing close to that. I'm right. not a super huge fan of that. So that one's a little bit tricky because you actually have to, at the very top of the settings menu, 
there is a thing that says activate HDR, or in your case, it'll say activate Dolby Vision because your TV supports Dolby Vision. You have to not activate Dolby Vision, which seems super unintuitive, but you have to not activate Dolby Vision. And then there is the uh, match source options. Okay. Match the source for dynamic range, match the source for frame rate, and now everything will display the way the original source was coming in that those are uh, very unintuitive but correct settings for there uh ps4 that one is a little tricky because you actually want to set it to linear pcm audio output we talked about this last week because the ps4 right. can't send out lossless bitstream audio uh and i don't think you'll be playing any discs on it because you use your xbox one x to play your discs right. so you actually want to set the ps4's audio output to linear pcm uh, and the, all the video stuff it should uh, do automatically and then for the receiver, you should be able to just plug in the whatever the microphone is, and it should walk them through the setup. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the setup on that is is really quite intuitive and good. Uh, the last little bit is that Vizio M70. Uh, only HDMI input, I believe it's HDMI input number one, is the only one that actually does have the full 18 gigabits of bandwidth for okay. 4K, uh, HDR, all that stuff. And you do need to activate the HDR color mode for that input so you have to go into the oh. input settings for the visio and click on the checkbox for hdr color because that's what turns on the full 18 gigabits of bandwidth there you go we've got time for one more bosco bosco yep bosco recently purchased an onkyo tx zr810 receiver we don't seem to talk about onkyo much these days what do we think of that unit uh I wasn't super impressed when I looked at it, to be honest with you. It has nice I mean, amplifiers. Its yeah, amplifiers it's, are quality amps. Seems kind of pricey for a 7.2 receiver. And you know, and I'm I mean, not a fan it? at all of their AccuEQ automatic yeah. setup. That's, uh, Accu that's the EQ, thing. That's, that's, that's really the, yeah. the sticking point for me is that as well. It's the, the room correction system kind of stinketh. <laughs> but uh, if you're not THX really making use of that, the rest of it is fine. The plus theater reference sound is worth not the paper it's printed on <laughs> as far as i'm concerned and there's not a, a ton of uh i mean it's got chromecast built in mm -hmm. uh, i guess that's nice but they they, uh, they put a nice power supply and good quality amplifiers in there so yeah. that that part i'm i'm on board with flare connect multi-room wireless fire technology. connect yeah it's not like fire it says flare f-l-a-r oh really Oh, that was Fire Connect. That's the that's their wireless whole house audio thingy. Well, somebody misspelled it on this page. <laughs> All right, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, the reason we don't talk about Onkyo that much is because for the same price, you can get more features and better features from other manufacturers. But that wasn't always the that case. Could Onkyo change. was yep. Onkyo was the go to brand for a long time, and the early days of this podcast, Onkyo was like, hey. If you want all the features, you got to buy Onkyo. There's mm -hmm. just not there's no other way about it. They were early adopters of Odyssey. But they have since been cutting corners, and they no longer have the processing power, and they won't pay for the. They're paying THX for certification, which I think is a big mistake. But they're doing <laughs> what they do. He knows that the ZR810 has the ability to buy amp the front left right speakers. Should he do it? He's planning on running a 7.2 setup, potentially having a Zone Two later on. So is the buy amp feature even an option? Not if you want 7.2. Nope. <laughs> Not if you want either of the two things you talked about. You know, if you want to have a 7.2 setup, you need to use all your seven amps. If you want to have a Zone Two, you could use five of your amps and then you power the other two with Zone two, the the Zone Two for the other two amps. But yeah, you can't buy amp. And why would you want to? How far away are you sitting from these speakers? Uh, this is got you got a great amp section in this receiver. It's one of its real strong points. Yeah. You but do not need to buy amp. All the amps in here are sharing one power supply, and the power rating is only for two channels driven. Right. So it, it, yeah, the, there's really no point in buy amping from the AV receiver to begin with. And then if you want 7.2, the, the amps aren't available. You can only buy amp if you're running a 5.2 system. Right. Uh, and then you can buy amp the front. So yeah, it's not even an option in your setup. So he's thinking about having a 20 amp electrical circuit run to his equipment. If he does, he'd still want a power conditioner. So which 20 amp power conditioner would we recommend? He does not have a rack. So he doesn't want a unit that comes with rack ears and all of that. By the way, most units that come with rack ears, those rack ears can be removed. Mm -hmm. But I have no clue. So Rob, answer. So I mean, funnily enough, when we talk about the 20 amp electrical circuit, we're not usually actually talking about plugging in 20 amp plugs into it um right we 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 mentioned that because very often when you have your standard 15 amp outlet you don't actually get the full 120 volts the full 15 amps you very often get less than that 
out of that actual outlet. Whereas if you install a 20 amp circuit, you actually get the full 15 amps that you wanted originally. There is nothing wrong with plugging a 15 amp power conditioner into a 20 amp circuit. That's not going to harm. So the plug anything. looks the same. You're not going to be looking at a plug on the on the wall that looks like something you plug your dryer in. Well, the 20 amp circuit actually has the the horizontal one of the one of the mm -hmm. tangs for the uh, plug is horizontal. Right. Uh, but the outlets on the back on, on any 20 amp outlet have both the vertical and the horizontal option. So you can plug any normal 15 amp device into a 20 amp outlet. The current is drawn, not pushed. So yeah. that, yeah. If uh, you're not asking for 20, you're not going to get 20. Yeah. So I would point you to my favorite power conditioner, which is a battery backup unit, which would be the J35 from APC. Because then you have battery backup, you have full voltage regulation, all the power conditioning, power filtering, all that good stuff. So I really like the J35. Uh, and if if you're just like, I'm going to put a 20 amp circuit and I want a full 20 amp power conditioner, APC does have their G type power conditioners, which are 20 amp. They don't, they don't have any that are battery backup. So it's only mm. power filtering, voltage regulation, you know, all the regular power conditioning stuff, but they do have their G-type units that are full 20-amp power conditioners. So that's the option if you want it. No battery backup on those. He wants to hear Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio from his movies, but he usually puts all of his movies on a USB stick or a USB hard drive. It's pirating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> previously, he was plugging in those USB storage units into his TV, and the movies played fine. But, of course, his TV doesn't play True HD or DTS HD. Now that he has his Onkyo receiver, it has a USB input. So can he plug his thumb drive or hard drive and get True HD or DTS Master Audio? And I don't think you can, dude. Not no. from uh, plugging it directly into a receiver. You would need to plug that into a computer of some sort, and the computer would have to send it out. Yeah, so the uh, the USB input on the Onkyo definitely does not support Dolby True HD and DTS HD Master Audio uh, surround sound. Uh, you can go through the Onkyo's manual and it will show you what formats are supported via the USB input and those are not amongst them. I wonder if the movies you have on your USB storage or your hard drive actually have retained their True HD and DTS HD Master Audio. If they are ripped, there's no guarantee. And if That's you didn't right. rip them yourself, there's really no guarantee yeah. that they do. Yeah, if these those were very large files. If these were downloaded, it's a high likelihood they don't. However, if these were backups that you made using Make MKV, then you right. absolutely might have retained it. However, you said you plugged these straight into your TV and they played just fine, which makes me think... That wasn't the case. <laughs> no, that's probably just stereo, dude. <laughs> Makes me think these were MP4 with probably AAC audio. So you got to make sure the sources that you actually have on your storage include the True HD or DTS HD Master Audio to begin with. Because if the right. source doesn't have it, you certainly can't play it back. But let's assume that they do. Let's assume they're backups that do include that audio. Uh, I would recommend an NVIDIA Shield. 200 bucks, right? 300 bucks? 200 bucks. Oh, actually, it's 180 bucks for the, if you don't, nice. don't get the game controller with it, um, which you don't really need if you're just using it for playback. I was going to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the really nice thing about the NVIDIA Shield TV, it's, it's zippy, it's fast, it's quite intuitive to set up. You can run Plex, you can run Kodi. If you do run Plex, it can be the Plex server and the Plex player, so you don't need separate devices to do that. Uh, it can transcode to, like, eight displays simultaneously, so it's actually a really good Plex server. Um, and it handles the full lossless bitstream output. You can even output Atmos and DTSX. Nice. It, can, it can handle all of that. So that's a really good player. Uh, but yeah, you can't just plug it straight into the USB of your receiver. Last, we're going to deal with Earl. Okay. Earl says, since HDR10 Plus is royalty-free, is there a better chance of seeing older TV models updated via firmware to, su firmware to support it? You know, a lot of times these firmware updates are not... are The problem there is not, uh, is it free, is it not free, you know, that sort of stuff. A lot of times it's what can is the what kind of hardware does the TV have. If it doesn't have the, the processing power to do whatever it is that they're, they're asking, or if it doesn't have the capability built in, no amount of fir firmware is going to fix it. It's like saying, you know, can I make my computer processor faster by updating the firmware? No, you need to update the hardware. So is there a better chance of seeing older TV since it's royalty-free? Uh, I mean, I guess. 
but uh, that's no guarantee that it's going to happen. A lot of these TVs, I don't think you're going to see many people go back and do many updates. Once they start putting out new models that have these features, they're going to be like, well, just buy the new one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. It actually seems very unlikely. HDR10 Plus is actually more processor intensive than even Dolby Vision, because um, it was kind of a workaround. <laughs> right. So it's not it's not even as efficient as Dolby Vision is. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty unlikely that older, less capable processor wise TVs are going to get that as a firmware update. It's it's pretty darn unlikely. Yeah. All right, so who do we got left, Rob? Ooh, we have a lot. We have eight questions left on our list. So we have That's Travis. Right. We have Infinite Gary. We have Steve. Scrolling past some pictures there. Uh, Grant, Jack, Gabriel. Oh, I wish we had answered Gabriel's. I like Gabriel's question because I actually figured out what his speakers are. Uh, that's a tease for you, Gabriel. Uh, Jonathan oh. and uh, Manuel. There we go. All right. Now I've got to see if I can figure them out. I looked at those pictures and went, man, I ain't got time for that nonsense. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I I mean, I, I was, it was struggling to stay awake. Uh, all right. So that'll be next week. Uh, this is AV Rant, the, the, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avramp.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. Our th- listeners of the week have supported our podcast in some way. So we want to thank Jack, who went to www.avrant.com and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and left us a PayPal, PayPal donation. So thank you, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Thanks so much for that donation. We also want to thank our third. 51 patrons over at Patreon who are signed up to give us a monthly donation, including Byron. So thank you, Byron, and our our other 50 patrons. Yeah, Byron, thanks for being a patron. Our other 50 patrons, that's patreon.com slash Podcast. Very awesome to see that number keep ticking up. And Robert and Michael talked us up to Butt Kicker and Accessories for Less. So thank you guys for... uh, Letting them know that uh, we we sent you them their way. Yeah, Robert, Michael, thanks for talking us up. Uh, somebody talk us up to Soundproofing Company. That that'd be. Yeah, good. I think that's about <laughs> that's 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 long overdue. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre, and I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.